4.2.0 was released two years ago, three years ago, and they achieved a score of 82%, 82% over 100. For all the people was so amazed that because they say, okay, we already solved the problem of how the proteins fold. But the, the most important thing here is not, okay, we already f know how to fold <coughs> proteins, but it's about we, we solve a complex or a very simple problem, but with complex implication. Because once they release alpha fold, when you can put the sequence and you now have a, a picture of how it's especially folded, they, they, a lot of people start working on that, but to build something or different stuff. There's a, a laboratory here in the US, a Baker, the Baker Labs. They, they begin try to map all the sequences and then try to correlate it to, about how they fold in the space, but then start the, the most relevant thing about this uh, outlining is about, okay, we know how sequence is related to the, to the form now, so why, why don't we hallucinate proteins? What means hallucinate proteins? Means that how if we try to create proteins and sequence with the forms that we want to. So th this is something interesting because in this case, they begin like using all the data we have and then try to build something new, something that is not in nature. In that case, we are designing, or they were designing their own proteins based on the motif that is continuous on imprinting. So what, what's the point about this? If AI solving a simple, a simple problem as the folding, but then begin this like new way of thinking the design, the design protein field, what is going to happen if we can solve it in the IBF world? Uh, I put this slide because I, 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 I try to, to like see what's the timeline of the IBF field, but we have this magnific lecture at two, at, two uh, at the morning that was quite amazed because they, they he speak a lot about how the the evolution of the art but something that is for me is to or I want to introduce here is okay what are the key points that turn the way of how IBF is conceived so I, I, th I think that one would be how AI is beginning to introduce in the, in the field. Yeah? First in medicine, but right now we are in the, in the way that we have the IBF using a lot of uh, artificial machine learning technology. But with, him, with this, we have also the, uh, I think the ICSI procedure is something that, that begin to, to, it's a current stop. In the, in the way how we conceive the IVF. Yeah. So the, the main concern is AI, artificial intelligence, is going to be the next, the next revolution in the IVF, in the assistant reproductive technologies. We are at that point. And I think that we are going to, 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 go to, to have a, a new way to conceive uh, uh, the way of, of the Reproductive technologies, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, but before that, let's, let's play a game in, and see why, why it's important to build this technology. Let's imagine we have these five embryo images. What are the embryo you are going to transfer? Take a time and think. Yeah. Or, or we can see it in the other way around. What would be the embryo that you want to transfer? Okay? So, Based on and, and opinion of several embryos, uh, embryologists, they say, okay, that, that's not gonna make it. So, okay, the other four, we're going to use it. But we can do it in the other way around. We have this more, these other five, and say, okay, what are the ones that we are going to transfer? Take a time, once again. What do you think? Yeah. If, if, we, if we have a, a body system right now, we, we are going to realize that we have our each opinion, that we don't have an objective way to select the precise embryo. But 
AIs can help us with that, yeah? Because the adequate one is the one in the corner, supposedly. Uh, and that's, that, that the majority say that, I don't know. <laughs> but for me, it's something, um, when, I, when I realize that, and that, that's why I moved to this field, is that, okay, we have a, a, a complex problem that maybe we can solve it in a simple way and then see how, how the, the revolution is going to be, okay? So how is work, you know, how, how AI or data science stuff works? We have images, we have also videos or, or the, the data we have, and then we try to estimate or, or try to see if we can build like a space of all the solution we have. In that case, we want to, to see if we can see some correlations, some tendencies, some patterns that we can find them, and then they use this pattern to take decisions. So th those images, we can estimate some features as the, the events of the time lapse, or maybe we can use some morphological traits, or in the case of the sperm, we can use kinetics features. So in that case, we have all the features we can have and then try to relate it to this space and then see if we can take a decision, okay? So in a more simple way. We have these 10, these 10 images. These 10 images is there are something that could be used to be transferred on something that don't. They are ones with EUPLUD or an EUPLUD. We, we have hatch, not hatching. So all that information, we can indeed have it or estimate it based on the features we know. So we have two ways of, uh, of thinking these problems. The first is if we have a level data, that means that we, we know which class belongs each image, and that we call supervised learning. A supervised learning, we want to classify and try to see if we can split the two groups, three, four, or many groups we want to, and then try to see if the, a model fits, and then if the model fits, what is our, our overall performance, and say, okay, we are accurate or not. But we have other way of thinking this, that is, what if we don't know what the outcome we want? And then we only want to split the information. In that case, we have unlabeled data and we want to cluster them. And then see if each cluster is related to any information, trait, or outcome we want to correlate. So, so that's how, in a, be, a be, very basic way, AI works. You know? So, okay. Uh, after all this introduction, in, our, in, the, in the company I work, or the company I work for, we, we build this AI system that help us to, or help embryologists to take decisions. They assist them in such a way that they can, they can how do you say, maybe bridge the gap between the experience because we know that something that it's very common is each one have their own opinion, but we want to homogenize the decision and see if the, we, we, that result in a, in a more, in, in an increase of the outcomes, yeah? So in that way, we, we built Erika. Erika is the system that ranks the embryos in a cycle, yeah? We, we use some mathematical stuff, some technological stuff, but the, the important thing is that based on the morphological traits, we can rank the maybe six, eight, 10 embryos in a cycle and say, okay, I think this is the more suitable one to, to go through all the process and have a good outcome. So in this case, you can, let me, let, let's see a video. This Erika system, you, you log in, fill your, pa your patient, and then once you have that, you can put all the images you want or the images of the embryo in a cycle and then see if what's the adequate one, what's the first, what's the, the worst, and something like that. So let's see. In this case, we, we, we use an, a synthetic one. We use five images, we put it, and then see, okay, rank them. In that case, the, the system told us that we have this A. 
and then we have the E that is the worst one, so we, we, are, we are preferred to use the A. But in that case, you have the, the decision to, to say, okay, maybe I am going to use it or maybe not, because as I told you, this is an system. It's not a, a way to say, okay, this is how the thing's going to be. No? Something that we want, I want to mention about this system, it was released in the 2020. At, that, at this moment, we are in 45, 44 clinics around the world. We are already analyzed almost 18,000 embryos. From that embryos, we, we, we have almost 4,000 of embryos transferred. And at this moment, we have the report. I, 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 I don't think, I, maybe it's a, a higher number, but we have the report that 2043 children are already born with the use of this technology. So AI is indeed helping because in this case, it's, it's simpler to only put the images and say, okay, what's, what's that? What's, what's to going to happen? But something important in this case is not about only the embryos because we already know that as actually when you are going to, to do some um, fertilization, you, you need to use the gametes. In that case, we, we say, okay, why don't we move also to, to gamete selection? So we are, going, we, we are doing some sperm stuff when we release this also software called SEED, when we associate the, um, the kinetics of the sperms and how we can use, choose the adequate one. So let's see another piece. In this case, we can, uh, the, the main problem about sperm selection is that a human only can watch like a few sperms. They can analyze all of them. But with seed, we can use all the microscopic field and then say, okay, we already analyzed and maybe that's the adequate one. So this is the suitable. And if we, we have proof that based on this, um, kinetics parameters, we can increase the outcome of the fertilization. Yeah? We have this, uh, we, we propose a score based on the, um, of the relationship between the motility features, and then we can see that with the use of seed, we increase the fertilization and also increase the blastocyst formation. Yeah? So, Something that is important is that this year, several clinics that are using our technology, they send some uh, abstracts to the ESRE conference and, and mention that they don't find any significant difference between the uh, our senior embryologists and the using of the seed, meaning that our software is, is as good as an experienced uh, embryologist. So these are the three clinics. Fertilis, Alpha, and Embryolab. One's from Canada, one's from Malaysia, and I think the other one is from Greece. Yeah. So we are going there. We, we, we are, I, I think we, I, I feel comfortable to say that we are actually solving the problem, maybe solving the problem. So we are working right now in the oocyte selection. We, we build this, it's a, a proof of concept technology called Cyetis, when you can watch the, Oh, sorry. You, you watch all sites and they, based on the morphology, they can uh, select, rank, and see what are the, the ones that, that we can use. This, we use this mainly to, to design these sibling oocytes uh, studies because we want to uh, split fairly in such a way that we can use the outcomes of our technologies. Yeah. We, we are working on this paper when we can relate the granulati, the shape, the color, and see what are the most um, impactful or important features to the uh, refertilization of the blastocyst formation. So before that, as I told you, something that I want to, to, to take account is what are AIs going to to do or going to be taken care at this moment or with the, in, in the IVF. I found this article, I don't remember Forbes time or where, 
when they ask to people, do you trust to the AI outcomes? They, they say that only 3.1 over 5, meaning 60% of the people trust on AI decisions. When they want to, to, to know why, they see that the, 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 the mainly thing is they don't know what AIs are doing or how are basing their decisions. So in, in a way to use the outcome of an AI, they want to know how are working and they want to know that there are a regulation behind them. So if we want to have a trustworthy AI, we have to have an explainable AI, we have to have a robust and reliable and a responsible and accountable one. Yeah. We are working on that. We want to, to, to build these AI systems that help to embryologists, andrologists, and all the clinic stuff involved in the IVF know how they work, but also try to, to say, okay, you don't have to be afraid because AIs won't steal your jobs, but people using AI will be, yeah? We know that we have a lot of uh, ways of using AI. We, we have this autonomous vehicle, we have Tesla, we have, uh, I think in Texas, the, an Uber without drivers. So we have known that there are people working on the automatization of AB, IVF, and we have working on AI. So let's hope that maybe in some times near, in a near future, we were going to have this technology involved in all the clinics. But I say that by combining, by combining the analytical capabilities of AI with the nuanced understanding of our experts, we can achieve breakthrough that were once impossible. Thanks. But we have this game that is, is something interesting. We, uh, you can scan the QR. Uh, we, you can, we have these synthetic cycles, and you, you want to rank them and see what are the relationship between our ranking system and the human exper experience system. So you can play a little bit and see how that will. <laughs> That was terrific, thank you. Um, okay, the last but not least speaker of this session. Up next we have Dr., and I apologize in advance for butchering any of the names with my pronunciation, Dr. Jose Jorge Hadas. Um, Dr. Jorge Hadas earned his university degree in molecular biology and biochemistry from the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid in 1993 and his PhD in the same university in 2000. Uh, he did his PhD working on virology with Dr. Margarita Salas, one of the most re reputable scientists in Spain. After that, he moved to uh, CSO, Chief Scientific Director, uh, Officer, of the Fundación IVI in Valencia until 2009. He was one of the founders and CSO of iGenomics at, um, until two, 2011, and you moved in 2011, there's a lot of moving here, uh, to the university for um, you became an assistant professor of, of genetics at the Pablo de Oli, Olavide University in Seville. Uh, you're on leave of absence now. And since 2011, he's been a founder of several companies um, of a technological base. So I can name a few of them. Recombine in Europe, IGLS, Sinai, Full Genomics, Overture Life, oh my goodness, Homu Health Ventures. He has studied the molecular basis of endometrial receptivity and other aspects of, in reproductive medicine. He's published 60 scientific publications. He has six patents and more than 15 books and book chapters. And he's worked again in Seville, in Munich, Cambridge, Brazil, Valencia, UCSD, and um, EVMS, my goodness. Um, so Dr. Jorge Hades will discover, uh, uh, discuss sorry, automation versus dehumanization in the IVF lab. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Jose Jorge Hades.
Thank you for the introduction. And first of all, I want to thank to Sheila and Nabil to be here, to be invited to work, to talk about um, presentation. Okay. Okay, now. To talk about automation and humanization, the humanization in the IBF lab. And this is the disclosure um, about the companies I, I work, most of them not related with this talk. And first is uh, to talk about robots. We robots are in, in our life every day. And uh, there is a conflict or not with robots and humans because at the end we have to uh, survive and live with them. There are some uh, processes in, the, in, the, uh, in every part of our life that is, are completely automated, but I think we have to distinguish between those uh, processes that are automated and they don't need, mainly, they almost don't need uh, the uh, supervision of, uh, of humans, like in the industry of cars and others, but in many others, it's totally necessary the supervision of one person. So I don't think that in IBF, Embryology Lab, Embryology Lab, and also in the, in the, the office of the gynecologist, that the robots or automation is going to, to really to be a conflict uh, to work every day. In fact, we are not uh, concerned about where we fly every, every week, every month, who actually pilots the plane? And the answer is, who cares? So you feel really safe when you are in the plane, and you, are really, you feel really safe when you are landing with fog, when it is completely automated in many airports. So this is happening every day, and nobody is uh, concerned about that. About Tesla that was mentioned before, even this automation uh, requires the, the supervision of the men, of the driver. And in fact, in the, when you uh, drive the, the Tesla, they say that you have to have your hands on the wheel while the conduction is completely automated. So, but in the IBF lab, bueno. okay now. This is the paper in 2021 in which uh, Adashi and uh, Gary Smith also, and Kashmir, Kashmir they, they talk about the automation and mini miniaturization of the IBF lab. About IBF lab, there are many, many different processes that can be automated. Not, not, not all of them can be automated, but most of them they can, they can be automated, mainly the sperm selection, the fertilization, embryo culture, embryo selection for transfer, but of course, cryopreservation. Hmm? So why automation? First, because increase, the increase in, in infertility worldwide, the increased demand, not enough supply. The process is mostly, mostly manual in every process in the lab. The data is kept in silos, in clinics, making analysis difficult. And because there is an increase in the age of maternity. Here you can see how uh, the increase of maternity in black in 1970s to 2000, and now 2020, in which the age of the maternity is increased a lot. So it, may, it means that uh, it, we are going to have more work in the future than we have now. In, <coughs> In fact, we have the double of cycle in 10 years since 2012. So it means there are not enough reproductive endocrinologists training. There is not enough expert embryologists, but it depends on the country. But for example, in Spain, we need ER, but we have, we need ER, but we have uh, an excess of en embryologists. So the clinics, they need the ER. There are not enough ER, but they, they have an overbooking of an embryologists in the lab. So at the end, uh, the, 
qualification of the professionals results in expensive IVF treatment. So, what's happened with, uh, with the manual processes? Mainly that there is a lot of variability between IVF center. This is clear. And this is not, not, not only depending on the technology, because in Spain, in my case, in our case, the technology, I mean, the technology means if you have an embryoscope or not, if you have a, 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 an incubator or other, or if you have good or, or bad embryologists, the aneuploidy rates at the end in egg donors is vary from 20% to 60% depending on the center. And the pregnancy rates uh, in the world, but also you can see this in Spain, vary from 10% to 80% depending on the center. At the end, the method and the skill level vary from center to center, operator to operator. This is an example of the an example of the differences in PGT uh, published by Santiago Munet a few years ago, over thousands of, of embryos, in which there are 42 uh, centers with a, a nuclear average of 30% in donors, but with a variation, a range of a nuclear since 18% to 60%, depending on the center. And these differences can be also shown in the same center in different doctors having the same embryology lab. This is a graphic that uh, was, uh, they give uh, the, the Obo Bank in Spain. They produce and sell thousands of oocytes to many clinics. And this is the differences between the warming and the survival of oocytes in different centers. The same oocytes from same donors in different centers. In different centers, you have uh, some clinics that they have a survival rate of 40%, 42%, and some of them they have a 100% using the same exactly kit of Kitasato in this case. So it means that the protocols are not well done in all the places, and this is part of the, uh, the result of the manual use of, of the protocol. And the same also is in embryology lab. Everything, most of them is manual. Paper team, preparing this is the use of the micro manipulator or the loading of the oocytes of the embryo in the straws. But also the gynecologist, because the gynecologists based in their experience, their hormone stimulation. So they, there is not a, there is a, a protocol, a standard protocol for the clinic, but they have to personalize in different patient due to their own experience of the clinic and their own embryology. And also the peak of the eggs is something that they learn with the, with, the, with the years. So is the solution for the standardized the results and to standardize the IVF or cl clinical uh, outcomes, the automation could be in some of the processes. So what automation can provide in theory? Same results in every center, every time, uh, in the labor, is a major cost of the IBF center, so there is a worldwide shortage of expert embryologists. Convenience, monitor at home or perform in the ob office. Infinite data, machines will share information versus one team experience. And finally, platform. This platform gives us a baseline from where to innovate faster. Why now? Not now. A few years ago, this is possible because we have affordable robotics with high precision and miniaturization, software that are making robots the new smartphone, the microfluidics. We have microfluidics for many years, but now we are applying microfluidics to IVF. Artificial intelligence is one of the topics that is also in this conference, and the IoT. What we are already automating the lab. Hormone dosing, there are several software programs that determine the hormones and the dosage and to have the best, the best clinical outcomes. 
sperm selection by macrofluidics, witness systems, time-lapse incubator. Probably this is the point in which we have developed the best uh, machines to automate the embryo development. I, I think that you, uh, 20 years ago, couldn't consider that you can leave the embryo for uh, a lot of time without watching every day to have a picture and to detect uh, uh, the morphology and to uh, evaluate the embryo. Embryo beautification, even that uh, some of them are not, go not working now, but they have been developed to help the embryologists at the lab in embryo beautification. And they automate sample A storage, and you know, everybody knows tomorrow. What is being now automated? I'm going to mention all of them, but I'm going to talk about a few of them. Automate ultrasound reading, outside retrieval, automate this preparation, automate denudation, egg and embryo vitrification and warming, ICSI, embryo selection by AI, and artificial uterus. AI for follicular scanning, cycle clarity. This is the way how it measures the number of follicles and the size of the follicles in an automated way. So in few seconds, you have all the follicles measured and the difference with the manual uh, or the human uh, work is the reduction in time more than 96%. So from 10 minutes to 0 0.3 minutes. And not only is a question of time, it's a question of quality because there are less differences among the different operators. Here you have the differences in the, from 2.3 millimeters to 0 0.2 millimeters, depending uh, in an automated way. And you can do at home. The second is the outside retrieval by uterine lavage uh, without surgery or anesthesia. This is something uh, still is developing, is in the process of being developed by Butterfly here in US, here in California. And mainly they have developed an intrauterine leverage system with the idea of facilitate to the doctor the collection of the oocytes with a less invasive intervention. So in less than 10 minutes you can obtain or get all the oocytes that are already um, that are in the in the tubal with the minimal discomfort without anesthesia. And it was proved uh, first to collect embryos that were, uh, were conceived, were fertilicide, fertilicide in vivo to do the PGD, collecting the embryos in the tubal and then in the uterus, and after to be transferred to the embryo, to the uterus. So the idea of this device, of this new methodology of uh, the end is not totally automated, but it's facilitating the automation of oocyte retrieval is to collect without any, um, without using the, any function by, by the cervix, to collect all the oocytes from the uterus and the tubal to do uh, whatever you are going to do, to freeze or to do genetic testing or to freeze. This has a lot of advantage, mainly there is no surgery, you don't need the operation room, it's cheaper per egg, and you can use also fever drugs, uh, you have less discomfort, and mainly you don't need anesthesia. The next is automate egg denudation. There are several uh, developments in, the, in processes. Uh, one of them uh, we are involved, the third one of Guerrero, is uh, being developed in Overture Life with uh, Sosu Santiago Mune. And mainly, probably this is one of the processes more manual that exists in embryology. It's really uh, hard to see how you are pushing the pipe, pipetting, pipetting until you get the oocyte uh, completely denuded. So it's exposed to changes of temperature, uh, you can expose to an excessive time of chemical by another base, and also the fluidic and, and to share stress. So there are several uh, development in the market or in the development. First is uh, by microchannels. There are other by ultrasonic microfluidic devices and robotic devices with good results in mice, similar 
post-denudation, survival, fertilization, blastulation in mice, and also in, with the robotic device, uh, good results in denudation, a blastocyst rate. In Overture, we are working with an open well egg denudation device or robotic by microfluidics, in which what we do is uh, uh, pull and push uh, liquid until we get all the cumulus cells uh, out of the oocyte. This is a one well, this is a, the first uh, prototype in one well, but we can do this also in a bigger machine doing all the oocytes at the same time. Here you can see how from one well to the other at the same time, this uh, had been done with uh, mice, but also with, uh, with human oocytes. Here you can see the same device, you can load until 18, uh, 16 eggs at the same time to do the denudation. The next one is the automated egg and embryo vitrification and warming, and probably the more advanced uh, development in uh, overture life where we, are, uh, where we are working, and in which we have developed this uh, machine that is very small. I want to show a small video, uh, a short video, to see how, how small it is and how it works. And mainly there is a biochip uh, device that is inserted in the in the in this machine and everything is done automatically. So there is this device contains two reservoirs for the media and in the uh, at the bottom there are many micro channels. What are we doing is to mix the different um, ES and VS media to do a gradient uh, for the for the vitrification. So it's in theory it's going to avoid uh, osmotic shocks in the in the oocytes. I'm going to shoot this video for you to understand that there is a small machine. Still, we are doing the, the clinical trials. So what we have to, we have demonstrated in mice and we have demonstrated in bovine, we need to be uh, to demonstrate in human. So we, mainly what we are doing is uh, um, clinical trials in Argentina and Mexico to have at the end results of blastocyst rate that are similar, should be similar to, to the manually. So after you do the, um, you fill first with the different, the two reservoirs with the media, the system, what it's doing is to fill uh, all the microfluidics until, and to fill the, the, the pool. And after the priming, you can take three minutes in total. You can put the oocytes or the embryos and the system is mixing the media. So that you can load the embryo. This is machine is using also for warming and for freezing, for both. The only thing that you can do, you have to do manually, of course, is to load, to load the embryos or to, do the, to load the oocytes under microscope. So the machine is really very, very small. And in 13 minutes, it finished. The second thing that uh, we have developed, it's uh, a new methodology for storing the, the oocytes on the embryo in a also very single way, because if not, you have to, at the end, you have to have the skill to upload to load the, the embryo or the oocytes in the straw. And this is a, we have called piccolo, that is basically is taking the embryos or the oocyte in a direct way and we freeze them. So these are the, the first results, are not the first result, the last result we have. And we have the results in the blastocyst rate and all the, in the different process, we have a very similar result that, that the vitrification, the manual vitrification. Now we are doing a, a test, I mean a clinical trial, in which with uh, uh, 94 egg donors, we are dividing the eggs and doing manually and doing, um, and doing with the da vitri. And what we expect is to have a pregnancy rate uh, standard that we have or has been published in SART. And the final uh, automation that is probably the most interesting today is the ICSI, 
Uh, this is a, has been developed in Barcelona, and Santi Monet, in fact, is a director of this project inside Overture, and mainly what we have developed is a automatic ICSI. I'm not going to show the video because it's too long, but mainly what he's doing is a known, a person that are not, is not expert of, uh, in embryology can manage uh, the, the ICSI-A, ICSI Automate, and to do the, the, um, the ICSI in an automated way. And we have done this in Hubster with similar results in survival rate and, uh, and two hours overnight. We have similar results. I don't know why the numbers are, or the presentation is changing the numbers, but mainly in hamster, in rabbit, survival, cleavage, and blastocyst rate are very similar. We uh, moved to mouse model with similar results also. And finally, we went to human, in which we have very good results on survival fertilization and span expanded blastocyst. However, we have a difference between euploidy and aneuploidy. And uh, we don't know why, but probably it's, the, it's, uh, it's due to the um, Non uh, expert, non, uh, the skill of, of non expertise of the uh, manipulator because it's not a, an embryologist, it's another person that can select the, the sperm. But in any case, we had in the, the first baby born a few months ago uh, in, with a new hope fertility in New York, and it was also the price of SRBT price in, uh, in 2022 and this was the first baby who was born uh, two or three months ago. Finally, I want to mention that uh, automation not only uh, should be done with, uh, with all the, the processes in IVF, but also in the embryo selection. The embryo biopsy, I think now PGT, PGTA, PGT, non-invasive PGT metabolomics is something that we have to uh, uh, implement in our lab. In an automated, automated way means to collect the media and to have everything down in a laboratory, external laboratory. So we want to pass from one to the other, mainly to metabolomics, from here to here, and also adding the AI to the selection of embryo. In conclusion, solely to say that automation is irreversible in IVF lab, as in other fields in medicine and in our life, that there are some processes that are difficult to automate in IVF, not impossible, but difficult, that uh, they are going to standardize the clinical results, that they are going to reduce errors in the IVF lab, and you all recognize that all we have a bad day, and the system reproduction professional will be happier, this is what we want, and they will have more time for research and personal development, and finally, that the loss of technical skill will be an election of the person. Thank you very much for your attention. We'll talk about that in just a minute. I'd like to invite the speakers of this amazing session back up to the stage. Mina and Omar, perfect, thank you. And please have a seat, and Jürgen is going to lead us. Um, we invite the audience, please, to ask questions. Uh, please state your name, your affiliation, and then address whichever speaker you'd like to with your question. Um, And it looks like we have a microphone, roaming, yeah. roaming s microphone, perfect. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much, Sandita, for the introduction. As he pointed out, please, when you have a question, stand up, uh, announce yourself, your position, and where you're from. So uh, it's open for discussion, please. Please. Sorry, I have a, my name's Ian. You are from Montgomery Facility oh, Section. Can you? Uh, can we can't can hear you? you? Oh. Uh, it's work. Yep. Thank you. My name's Yemi Family. You are from Montgomery Fertility Center. Is that better? No? Take my one. It's fine. Nope. Uh, it's it's put it in your mouth. Okay, gotcha. My name's
my name is Yemi Famuyiwa from Montgomery Fertility Center. And I am not a lab person. I'm the medical director, so I do the clinical side. So I have a lab question, so forgive me if it's a very naive one. I really, really am excited about all the automation. The question is, when you're using, um, hopefully you'll get the lab working almost on autopilot, where you can load the stores, freeze the egg, freeze the embryo. Will it be able to load individual eggs into a one store, you know, or an individual um, instead of one or two? I think you're putting six in your well? Yes. Okay. I mean, uh, now at the moment, uh, what uh, is not uh, automated is uh, to load the, the oocytes in the uh, straw, but this is because we have developed the, the piccolo, that this automatically is taking everything, not automatically, it's manually now, but we have a robot that is going to take all the uh, oocytes and freeze directly. So, but at the moment, of course, this process is not automated, it's manual. Another question, please. William please. Ferguson here. I'm a attorney, so probably uh, in the minority. But um, I had a question for Omar. Um, regarding your the Erica program, um, how did you come about, I guess, training it? What were the features? Did you pick the features, or were the features, um, I guess, alloc or ascertained by the system itself? Now, the, our first version is based on um, features that embryologists mentioned that it's, are, are important to, to look at. Mm -hmm. But we are currently working on a way that we can use, indeed, some features that maybe or as a humans, we didn't think about it because we have a limitation about what can we see, what are we seeing, and also we have this bias of see, okay, we, we have to to look at, I don't know, the Zona Pelucida, or we can we have to watch the polar body. But with the systems, we can use any pixel, any relationship between the pixels, so we are moving to that way in, to, to capture more information that we are ignoring right now. Okay, great. Thank you. So we'll be looking forward to 2.0 then. Yeah. Hi, Colin Michael from um, San Francisco. Um, one quick question going back to the, the retrieval of um, oocytes um, you know, through the uterus. Um, three factors. What about tubal disease? What about what's the recovery of those oocytes after stimulation? I can't imagine having 100 oocytes retrieved through the um, uterus that way with the lavage. Can you comment on that at all? I don't know if I understand you well. All right. Um, somebody goes through a estimation cycle, has 130 um, oocytes um, that you see, mature oocytes. What's the recovery from the, tubo, the, tu the uterine lavage when you're doing it that way? How many do you retrieve? Well, then, then I can make that. Exactly. <laughs> like uh, I'm Moses Cesario, CEO of Butterfly Bio, and we're advancing uterine lavage. Um, we're getting 65% back right now, and um, so that's the efficiency. Uh, we're not getting everything out, right? We're not getting everything out, but that's about what we're recovering. So, yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Paul Magarelli from Kind Buddy. Um, much like the Tesla and much like the automation of many things, uh, and I don't, it's not to throw a wet blanket on it, but the legal implication of the automation uh, that has to be number one in your, your corporation's concerns. And I'm just curious if you guys would like to comment on the, the, the liability associated with having the machines do this for you. I mean, if it is approved by a regulatory like FDA, I mean, why not? You know, this is, a, I think that automation in many of the cases are more safe than manually. And in fact, the results of the manually work in the, in the IVF lab are giving differences in results, very clear in any aspect, in every aspect of the, uh, of the IVF lab, in vitrification and employee, we have seen before. So I don't think this is going to be, this is something you have to solve, but once it's solved, I don't think it's uh, any problem. Sorry?
<laughs> Good question. I don't know. Yeah. We, we have the attorney here, yeah. so you can. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Everyone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the rules are very different. The rules are completely different in different countries. So uh, really, I don't know here, but uh, of course, the clinics is responsible at the end in, uh, in all the aspects, as he said. But uh, really, it's not, I don't have the answer. I, 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 want to, I want to follow that question, too. Uh, it's interesting because it's something that we, as I told you, is a hot topic. Right now with ChatGPT, we have a lot of stuff to, to think about, the, the, the ethics of all the stuff. But something that is crucial is that I remember two years ago re read this paper that mentioned that I think there are like 26, 36 people in the world working on cyber ethics and robotic ethics and AI ethics. So we, we need more people working in that field because we, we know how to do things, but we don't we, we are doing it in a, a way to help people, but we know that there are many people that don't look at it that way. So it, it's something that is it's important is to know who who is going to be responsible, the, the developer, the the, way, the, 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 the the guy that is using it, or the company, I don't know. That because it's a, a question that we don't know the answer. It's like the egg and the chicken question. So, is the one that build it? Is the one that using it? Or is the one that are selling it? So, I think we, we don't we don't have an answer right now, but we have to work on that. Yes, I have a question. Lucho Walcaba from Guadalajara, Mexico. Uh, I congratulate you all of you for an amazing talk. Uh, regarding the vitrification, the vitri, Hassan, I have a, one question. Uh, last February, Masa Kuwayama launched in Mexico, ready to use. Okay. So cheap, so quick, and so uh, you spend at least five minutes to do vitrification in a good way. I wonder what is going to be the advantage to use this de device in the future, I, I mean, automatic side this procedure, what is going to be the advantage, cost, effecti effectiveness? Well, I think cost is one, and if, if not with time, the time of consuming uh, for the vitrification or the vitrification, the graphic I showed with the uh, differences in, in warming in the different clinics is real. So there are 54 clinics, and 50% of them, they have very bad uh, warming uh, or survival rate. Why? Because probably they are not doing, performing the protocol in the right way, for sure. What is going to avoid this? To standardize that. If you have 95% of survival, it's 95% in your clinic, in Tijuana, in Mexico, in Spain, and in any country. And if you have a embryologist, as it's not the, the skills of the embryology, it's going not to be, not, you don't need to be the, the expert of embryologists to, to do that. In fact, it's a process that should be very simple. And it's simple, but now it requires skills. So this is because the last conclusion was the loss of skills of the embryologist is, is going to depend on the person. But you have to maintain your skills even if you have something automated. What I mean, a pilot, even with the automatic pilots in the, in the, in the plane, they know how to land. And they need to know. So the embryologist has to know to freeze and warm. But if you have a machine helping to you every day, your life is going to be better. And probably if you have a bad day, you have a hangover, for example. <laughs> you don't do, don't, don't do mistakes. You, this is something that what we, I want to. So it's, it's going to be more safe and standardized and democratized IBF. If you take three, four minutes more, I think it's not important if you have really the same results with all the patients, or all the women. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Go ahead, Millie. Yeah. Um, Millie Thakur. I'm a REI and a geneticist. Excellent talks. Um, to all the experts on the table and all, all everybody, every clinic is doing different things. We don't have a standardized way. Different techniques are being um, validated in different places. For the experts, I want to know when do you predict this will become mainstream? So, mainly for Dr. 
Jose, in terms of like, you did different techniques, maybe 12, 15 different things. When can a, a medical person imagine it happening? The reason why I ask this question is the technology is exponential. So when we predict it's gonna take us 10 years that this would be mainstream, it's gonna take a shorter time than that. And do you have a prediction of when all of these techniques are going to be available for a physician and a patient to go through an IVF cycle? Well, I, I think this is one when we say uh, in, in Overture and other, in other companies to democratize the IVF, it means to be cheaper. It means to be no cost for the machine, for example. I think that if there is no cost, it's going to be available for many clinics. And not like now. I come from Colombia last week, and many people are not doing a PGTA because they don't have a laser. So PGTA is good, but if you don't have a laser, you cannot do that. So I don't know. I think it depends on the cost or no cost. It depends. Uh, I think all we here and in IBF, in this field, we are very open to new technologies all the time. People, they need, we need all the time. We are talking, what is new? So at the time it's, uh, it's ready and it's cheap, I think it's going to be. When all is going to be ready in the lab, I think little by little, step by, uh, by step, are going to be, it's like embryoscope. Still many people, they don't have an embryoscope and many other things. So it's going to be like now, but I think if it is free, many of the technologies are free, uh, the machines are going to be very fast to be in every single IBF lab in, in the world. So if I uh, could add, uh, I think uh, predictions are really tough. <laughs> and uh, you put yourself on the spot by saying, oh, I think this will happen in the next 10 years, and then 10 years passes by and uh, nothing. But in this case, because we are talking about AI um, and uh, incorporation of AI into the operations of the laboratory, uh, in ART, I think it might be faster than we think. Because it's unimaginable to us the speed at which this can move forward. Uh, just look at ChatGPT and other AI platforms, these language models. Well, they're not language models anymore. That was. Uh, a month ago. Uh, now, they are creative models. So the field is advancing so fast that um, it's simply difficult to imagine what will happen in the next five years even, two years. Uh, so that's one aspect. But the other aspect of it is the, the road to full automation of the IVF laboratory is a tough one. It's really tough. I think what, um, the, what Overture and IVF 2.0, what they have achieved is tremendous because they may seem uh, trivial, for example, for the for the uh, AI, the imaging system, to recognize an egg. Well, for a human, that's simple. Well, that's an egg. But it is not for uh, artificial intelligence. So everything has to be taught. Um, and so imagine the number of steps involved in an ICSI procedure from the time you have to, uh, well, of course, collecting the eggs, but let's just talk, focus on ICSI itself. Uh, you have to denude them. You have to select the mature ones. You have to prepare your ICSI dish. You have to move those eggs in some kind of order and not all at the same time into the ICSI dish. You have to prepare your sperm. You have to add the sperm to your PVP drop. 
you have to put the dish in on this on the uh, micro manipulator you have to put your tools in you have to lower them <laughs> You have to approach the egg, you have to get in there, you have to deposit the sperm, you have to withdraw this, the, the, the needle, you know, raise your tools, take the dish back, put the eggs away in, in, in a culture dish, and put the culture dish away. Okay. That's all we have to do. <laughs> and, and so, automation, is, is, it's an interesting word, because ICSI was automated in the case of this uh, beautiful paper that, by the way, we will be publishing, or has been published by RBMO, um, and uh, you will be able to read what beautiful work they did on this. Um, it's a major achievement to get that needle to automatically approach the oocyte, recognize the zona pellucida, drill with the piezo through the zona pellucida just to the right point, withdraw, let the zona material out, go back in, bring the sperm down, and break the oolema by pressing against it, enter the egg, and deposit the sperm. That is quite an achievement, but you can also imagine how difficult it is to fully automate this process. So sorry for the long answer, but I, I wanted to bring in this publication. Uh, it's a plug for, for you, but also a plug for RBMO. Uh, so uh, that's, that's what I think. Thank you so much, that was terrific. Um, Nabil, yes. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for the presentation. Very, very interesting. The topic of uh, automation, lab automation, and AI, which I think both of them could be combined at some point. So the, the automation was focused on the IVF lab, and the AI talk was focused on the embryo assessment and egg assessment. Do you see any space for automation and AI in the actual clinical aspects, for example, the simulation, choosing the right protocol, adjusting in real time, and then for the robotics, transfer, transferring embryo with some some, some sort of robot or or tools that 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 have better efficiency at, at transferring embryos in the endometrium. Yeah, well, I, I will take that first. Um, I think yes. I think yes because I, I remember when when I got get hired to to IBF, I was talking to to the CEO and he mentioned, okay, we are going to start working on some other stuff. They they planning to work on robotics and all the stuff, automatiz automatization. But he mentioned something that that was quite a mess for me. He mentioned, I want you to build the brains of the robotics I want to build. That meaning that we can use, or, or he was seeing the same that me, that we can build AI systems involved in all the procedures of the IVF. And I think we are going to do it. Right now we are focusing on embryo selection, gamete selection. We are going to move to time lapse also. But there are a lot of opportunities to recognize and then make easier to translate what, what, what we are watching on the microscope to what the machines are understanding. So, so I think, yes. That was, in fact, two of these developments were in outside retrieval and in uh, follicle counting and, and measurement. So I think, of course, there is a uh, space for that. I think that in the 10th genes symposium in 10 years, you can focus. <laughs> due to your question, we can focus on what's happened for the first and the 10th uh, genes symposium. What is has been implemented in the daily routine in the lab and in the, in the clinical uh, work, so. Jürgen, take us home. Um, yeah, my personal opinion, uh, you know, we're all scientists and we would be not good scientists if we, we would not approach the future with new technology, is it AI or automatic. Uh, we still have to be careful, I mean, especially for healthcare system, I think. Um, it needs a good ethic framework because we still 
feel like we should be responsible for making decisions. And uh, the algorithm we use is basically uh, data we generated from the past, right? So uh, we are open for this, but we also have to move forward in responsible steps to implement that in the future. So I have also one question for Dr. Alikani. You mentioned because you know nobody talked about your talk, so you talked about T8 and T9. I always thought that actually the early ones, T1, T2, 3, actually you know were you looking for because they are so important to have finally the right embryo. Is it compaction or early blastocyst? But you didn't mention them in your talk at all. Yeah, no, actually, you know, as I mentioned in the analysis, the recent analysis that uh, K has come out of uh, care fertility, they did notice that every one of those parameters was actually delayed in aneuploid embryos. So the, what was difficult, the message to get across, was the difference between the findings based on the care fertility data set versus the findings that they extracted from a meta-analysis of 20 or so papers that are out there that they were able to analyze. So they are somewhat contradictory or at least not fully aligned and their, their model is showing which is a logistic regression model, is showing that putting in all of those factors will give you, in the end, an AUC of 0.71, uh, which is quite nice. So yes, those, uh, those uh, time points are also important. Yeah. So, and I remember Marcus Messinger, when he started all this many years ago, uh, you know, definition of T3 was like conversion from a two to the three cell, yeah. and then, so, but I saw T3, you call it like 27 hours, what I was surprised so early. It's usually 34 hours. Uh, on, I haven't particularly looked at It was the based on that Bamford paper. The Bamford paper, mm -hmm. yeah. So they are seeing, they're seeing uh, definitely that this, uh, that the delay, uh, is much more prevalent in aneuploid embryos. And it could be that on average, they see an earlier uh, division in, in that time point. But uh, I don't recall the, the details. I could not answer that directly. OK. Any other questions? Yeah, I think, I think we're at time. So I wanted to uh, thank all the speakers for your time and for sharing your knowledge. These presentations were amazing. Um, and I believe if you have questions, please feel free to approach the speakers after the session. Um, I'm not sure if I should hand this over to Progenesis leadership. Yep. So I invite all of you to go to the next room for a coffee break for 30 minutes, and we will be back.
course, the uh, let me do something here. So I'm going to go ahead and talk. Well, uh, saving. Do, 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 do. File, export, not as a video, let's change files, uh, let's see, create an X, no, don't want a PDF, so day one, let's try that again, and do you want me mumbling or actually speaking correctly? And do we want two microphones for when they turn away and, and look at their slides? Or should we just pop it on the other side, maybe? Mm, yes. I'm just, because they, they're all doing this. But. I'm thinking the same angle, only on the other side of the podium. Uh, Control-Z. I hate other people's computers. I mean, I hate working on other people's computers. File. Save a copy. Ben, um, could you cycle through the lights real quick? Bring them all down on the slider, and then just bump through. You would probably like your laptop, Mademoiselle. It is parked right over there, on to the just to the left of the monitor. Yep. So. Oh, perfect. Um, and I am also waiting for uh, Thomas to give me an updated. So that's one. Thank you. Two. That's two. One is, not, one is not, not even a back. OK, so if you could bump through. So that's two. And then what's three? OK. And, and four? 
Okay, four was the one, so four is both backlights. <sighs> okay, that answers that question. Thank you. There is not. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm okay with having it at two. Um, it's four that's the issue because it's both backlights and the sidewash. But let me tip that to where we at least get a little more of a... See, both of them and that. And Okay.
Hi, everyone. If you're in the break room, please make your way back over to the speaker room. Sure, but the, um, they can hear it a little bit if they're out in the hallway.
chest. Thank you. All right, everyone, if you're in the break room in the hallway, please begin to make your way back in as we begin our second segment. We are looking forward to our next set of talks. Thank you. The microphone is this, no? Hello? Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. We are going to begin our next session. Just waiting people come back. I hope everybody enjoyed the last session on AI. And thank you very much for your participation. We really appreciate that the audience can participate, make questions on the discussions. Good morning, my name is Dr. Fernanda Pacheco. I'm going to be the moderator of this session with Dr. Mili Takur. This session is about endocrinology and the art of ovarian stimulation. We know that every patient is unique, so we need to individualize the plan of treatment for each patient. And the IVF is a comprehensive field, and the, the clinical set is an important piece of IVF for the outcomes that we, we want. So I'm very honored to present our first speaker, Dr. Richard Paulson. Dr. Richard Paulson holds the Alaya Tutor Chair in Reproductive Medicine, is professor and vice chair of the Department of OBGYN and Chief of the Division of Reproductive Endocrinology 
and Infertility at Keck School of Medicine of the University of Southern California. He is past president of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, the Pacific Coast Reproductive Society, and the Society for Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility. He serves as Editor-in-Chief of Fertility and Sterility. Dr. Paulson has authored over 200 scientific articles and has received numerous research awards. His major research interest is reproductive aging with a particular emphasis on endometrial receptivity and fertility preservation. Dr. Paulson will be presenting on induction of endometrial receptivity for frozen embryo transfers, a rational approach to estrogen and progesterone administration. Dr. Paulson, welcome. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. It's my great pleasure to be here with all of you and lovely sunny San Diego, uh, and to, uh, I really am very thankful to the course organizers for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to be here with all of you. So I'd like to talk about endometrial preparation, there it is, for frozen embryo transfer and really for any kind of synchronization. When we started doing egg donation many years ago, uh, talking about reproductive aging, of course, all of those cycles were synchronized. Um, embryo cryopreservation that you heard about earlier this morning was not a reality. Well, it was kind of a reality, but we lost 20% of the embryos in the freeze, and those that came out had a reduced potential for implantation that was easily 20 or 30% less. So we tried to transfer embryos fresh if possible, and that's how we got involved with all of this concept of estrogen and progesterone. And uh, not, I will tell you that not much has changed in terms of the way how we prepare and how we administer estrogen and progesterone since the early days. Maybe we have shifted the progesterone start to be a little bit later, and I'll try to show you the, the data that underlies that particular suggestion. The one thing that I would like to tell you is that we used to use histology, of course, to try to figure out whether we were getting the, the estrogen-progesterone ratio. There was much to do about estrogen-progesterone ratio, which, by the way, I think is not a reality. Uh, but you, I will tell you that you need adequate estrogen preparation before you start progesterone. One of the things that really bothers me about a lot of the endometrial receptivity studies that are being done now is that they use a surrogate endpoint of an endometrial thickness of seven millimeters as saying that is adequate estrogen preparation. So that's probably not true. So the, there's a huge variability, of course, in the endometrial thickness. And the one thing that we found out a long time ago is that if we did not have adequate estrogen preparation, you then had very inadequate luteal progression. So the luteal phase really depends on the endometrial preparation ahead of time. So keep that in the back of your mind, because a lot of the studies that have been done or that have purported to show that, oh, the window is displaced and all that other stuff, yeah, they're just looking at the duration of progesterone. They're not thinking about, did we get adequate progesterone receptors during the priming at the beginning? Okay, enough preamble. I have no uh, relevant disclosures. We're gonna talk about hormonal control about endometrial receptivity. We're gonna differentiate between various routes of administration of estrogen and progesterone, and we're gonna talk about appropriate timing of the initiation. So, you know, I like to think of endometrial receptivity as being just a component of really the three major classes of factors that are involved in embryo implantation. And really, embryo quality is probably the most important one. That's probably the rate-limiting step of what we do. But it's good to remember that endometrial receptivity needs to be adequate, and if it's poor because the endometrium is, is uh, distorted by myomas or something like that, that will prevent embryo implantation. And of course, if you, do, if you have bad transfer technique or if you put the embryo into the wrong place, then it's also not going to implant. So it's a component of the overall picture of embryo implantation. The other thing that I really wanted to 
share with you is this concept that implantation is a mechanical event. So it's not a black box where you know you put the embryo in there and then you close your eyes and you hope that pregnancy occurs. That embryo has to somehow make its way to the surface of the endometrium. So how do you know that it's opposed, that it's actually on the endometrium? You say, well, I, I put the embryo into the endometrial cavity. I see that on the ultrasound, so I know I did that. Okay, yeah, you put it into the endometrial cavity, and where is it now? So it is not touching the surface of the endometrium, right? The endometrium is secreting all of these major mucin molecules, the proteins that are then saturated with the physiological fluid, and that is how the embryo floats around in the endometrium. I would suggest to you that that is, of course, how it also migrates from the fallopian tube, or for that matter, migrates back out into the fallopian tube when you get that occasional ectopic pregnancy after an embryo transfer. So it has to come down to the surface somehow, and that's the mechanical part of the implantation. So how does the embryo migrate towards the surface? So it doesn't have a, a flagellum, has no means of locomotion, and even if it did, it would be very hard to get through all of that mucus. So the mucus has to be absorbed and has to be gotten out of the way, and that is the function of the endometrium. So if there is some sort of physiological principle of how it is that the endometrium allows the embryo to implant, it has to include the uptake of the secretions that are filling the endometrial cavity that allows that endometrium to come down, make contact, and actually implant. And here's a great picture from a, a paper that was in the New England Journal, now, unbelievable, that was 22 years ago, uh, showing the blastocysts sort of being opposed uh, next to the endometrium, and you see the little bumps underneath there. I don't know how well that projects. The word penopods are under there, and I'll show you some pictures of that. That is probably the epiphenomenon of the surface epithelium taking up those macromolecules, and then by osmotic pressure, they swell up and make these bumps. So the bumps on the surface of the, of the endometrial cells are not uh, receptors that are reaching up towards the embryo. They're tiny. They're just a couple of microns but they probably are an indicator that the embryo is coming down. I did, Denny made me do this, okay. <laughs> In case you're thinking of the embryo as a soccer ball, okay. So, so these are pinopodes. They were described by Alexander Sykios uh, back in the 1990s, and he was Greek, and that's why he came up with this term as opposed to uh, penocytosis. This is, these are the pinopods, and that's what they look like. They're bumps uh, on the surface of the endometrium, and if you imagine that that epithelium took up, you know, MUC1, MUC2, all of those mucin molecules, uh, then, then that it might absorb the fluid and then be swollen up like that. All right, so estrogen and progesterone. So both are needed, alone are sufficient, and no other factor has been found to improve endometrial receptivity. We tried uh, LH and we tried HCG. Some of you may recall the studies uh, where they tried to flush the endometrial cavity with HCG prior to embryo transfer. None of that has panned out, so we're back to estrogen and progesterone. It's useful to remember that nature does not have sort of step functions. It doesn't go from zero to 100. You know, there's always sort of gradual rises. There's a gradual rise to LH, gradual rise to progesterone. And we sort of try to imitate that. But because we give exogenous medication, we do have these step functions where you go from nothing to a lot. All right, so estrogen responsible for endometrial proliferation. And as we just talked about, progesterone receptors. How much do you need? How do you give it? And for how long should you give it? So. Lots of routes of estrogen administration. There's not much estradiol around, so you just need to get a little bit in there. It's measured in picograms. And oral transdermal vaginal and all the other forms really work probably equally well. Oral administration, of course, is subject to first pass metabolism, and it gets converted. The estradiol that you give to the patient is immediately converted to estrone and estrone sulfate. And then there's an equilibrium between E2, E1, and E1 sulfate. Uh, that looks like this. These are pictures of the molecules, and estradiol is at the top, and then estrone in the middle, and estrone sulfate at the bottom. Transdermal estrogen actually is uh, more similar to in vivo production in that it avoids the first pass metabolism, and it, it gives you about the, the same kind of ratio of E2 to E1 as you have if you measure uh, estradiol in a normal ovulatory cycle. And there's an easy conversion in there. A 0.1 milligram pad should give you about 100 picograms per ml, which is a, approximately equivalent to two milligrams oral. So 
Uh, if you want to know how to convert 2 milligram POBID, the answer is you need to put two patches on. And there were studies early on that purported to show that the histology was better after, uh, after patch administration. That probably has not panned out because the, of the equilibrium that we just talked about. So even though you have a lot of estrone and estrone sulfate after oral administration, it's converted back to estradiol and that doesn't seem to be a problem. These are the levels that you expect. Uh, the top line, for example, is a 0.1 milligram patch, and you see it's about 100 picograms per ml. So it has a reasonable uh, predictability. If you want to give somebody estrogen for a long time, I like the idea of giving them two patches. I figure they have about 200 picograms per ml. I will tell you that there's a huge variability. If you measure estradiol, which you can in a patch, because it should have theoretically constant levels, right? Not much point in measuring it after oral administration because you know you're gonna have these spikes and, and, and troughs. That it varies hugely from person to person and even within the same person from day to day. So this is lovely, but I think that those people would have had to have been locked up someplace. I think if you walk around and your skin gets warm and you have higher circulation or it gets cold, whatever it is, that makes a big difference in terms of the way that the estradiol is absorbed. So. There is a lot of fluctuation and a lot of variability, but I do like the ability to at least estimate uh, what levels to expect when I give somebody a patch. So we use about patches and oral uh, estro estrogen uh, essentially interchangeably. Vaginal estradiol administration I thought was a really good idea because it would get uh, absorbed really well. And what you're seeing here are the serum estradiol levels where, when patients took oral estrase, and that's uh, oral micronized estradiol, or if we give it to them vaginally, and these are the same uh, tablets that you buy at the store, there's nothing different about it. And you can see that without the first pass through the liver that you get much higher levels, and in fact, you have serum levels that are 2,000 and 2,300. So those are levels that you'd normally only see with ovarian hyperstimulation. But here's the kicker, the uh, endometrial tissue levels are even higher than that. They're about 80 times higher than what you have after oral administration. So there is nothing even vaguely physiological uh, about the, the levels and, uh, that you get in a patient after you give them vaginal administration. And we did manage to uh, um, get a research prize for this because we thought that patients who had thin endometrium after two weeks of standard oral therapy could be treated with vaginal. Uh, estrogen, and then, then once they got to seven millimeters, we gave them the progesterone. So on the left side, you see the total number of weeks that the patients received the estradiol, and then the number of patients, of course, was not very high, but uh, they all got pregnant, which was great. So at least we know that we weren't harming them by giving them the super high uh, estrogen levels. What's missing from this study, of course, is the control group that would have received the same oral medication for another two weeks or another three weeks. And we sort of thought about that afterwards. Gee, I wonder if it's just time rather than the total amount of dose. And so uh, that's kind of the approach that we have taken now. Um, I like in somebody where you can't get the adequate endometrial thickness is to put them on patches because then I know they're getting estradiol. I know it's going to be constant. And then drag it out. Give them five or six weeks of estrogen. That does not seem to be in any way harmful. And at least you can get the cosmetic result of having a seven millimeter endometrium, whether or not that's critical to implantation is another debate that we would have to have. So in summary for estradiol, uh, the oral route is probably the one that is most commonly used. It's uh, probably the most convenient. Lots of first pass metabolism. Transdermal is most physiologic. We use it a lot. Vaginal, highest endometrial levels. And the duration is fine. You can really go for a long time uh, without worrying that you're going to somehow overstimulate the endometrium or that that will somehow impede uh, implantation. So progesterone, of course, needs progesterone receptors. You can't just put somebody on progesterone unless they have been adequately primed by estradiol, which is what induces those progesterone receptors. It's progesterone that opens that receptivity window that apparently turns on the program in the endometrial cells to bring the embryo down to the surface. And the question is, how much do you need to give? What's the best route of administration, and how should you time it? And the answer is that there's probably not such a thing as too much progesterone. So serum progesterone levels in the natural luteal phase, of course, are very pulsatile. So if you see a study that says we measured a single uh, value of serum progesterone in the uh, luteal phase just prior to embryo transfer, and we found that the levels correlated with whether the patient became pregnant or not, you have to say, 
But isn't it pulsatile like that? Yes, it is pulsatile. So I'm skeptical about those data. So which is best? So progesterone, of course, is much higher levels than estradiol. It's measured in nanograms. It's about 100 times as much steroid that you have to give. And the oral administration is really prohibitive. So it has never been shown to be adequate for fertility. It may be OK for menopause uh, to uh, antagonize uh, estrogen, but it is not useful for fertility care. So trans, what about transdermal? You can do that for estrogen. But progesterone, again, would be a huge amount of patch that you would need, right? It would have to be kind of a jacket that the patient would kind of put on. And then on top of that, you've got 5-alpha reductase uh, in the skin, which converts testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. It also converts progesterone to dihydroprogesterone, and so probably prohibitive. That is why you're not seeing progesterone patches. So really, we just have IM and vaginal. And just as with the estrogen that I showed you, the endometrial progesterone levels are much higher after vaginal then even in, after intramuscular, this was our study from 94, but uh, there's a prettier s slide, which is this one, which was uh, Ciccinelli and uh, De Ziegler, where they looked at serum progesterone levels. And these are comparison of vaginal progesterone, which was crinone, the, the gel, and then intramuscular progesterone was in the other group. And they thought, when they saw our paper, that maybe we had contaminated the endometrium with the pipel, because that's what we were doing. We were doing a pipel biopsy and, and aspirating the, the endometrium, and that was actually a valid criticism. You're going through the cervix, and guess what? There's a lot of progesterone on the ectocervix, so maybe we were contaminating our specimen. And so what they did is they had the patients take the medication just prior to hysterectomy. They took the, the uterus, sliced it from the top, and then extracted the endometrium that way. And as you can see, they have the same results. So serum progesterone levels much higher after IM. That's the blue or turquoise bar on the left side, as opposed to the relatively low levels after crinone. Those are about 4.8 nanograms per mil. But the endometrial tissue levels much higher with the vaginal administration than with IM. And so they came up with the very clever term of calling it uterine first pass effect, which I think has kind of stuck. So I am versus vaginal progesterone, I thought was going to all go towards vaginal progesterone administration. And in fact, there were, uh, not only were there any number of studies, but this was a meta-analysis. This is from the Cochrane database. And it's not quite statistically significant. You see the bar down at the bottom. It's skewed over towards the right, which favors vaginal. And then there was one of these that turned out to be statistically significant. I think this was the clinical pregnancy rate at the bottom, again, favoring vaginal progesterone. And so that's where life was, and life was good, until, of course, we had the Kate Devine study in fertility and sterility. And that's why we're all still having to use IM. So the, this was a randomized clinical trial which you had IM in one group and vaginal uh, in group B, but every third day they got one shot IM, and then group C was vaginal alone. And uh, as most of you know, it didn't go well for the vaginal group. So this is the um, positive uh, HCG, and you see that it's very similar, 65, 66, and 60. But they had this really extraordinarily high miscarriage rate in the last group there on the right. And so whereas the miscarriage rate or overall pregnancy loss in group A and B were like 22 and then 29, the, um, the group that had the vaginal only, we're going to let that go, it had a super high miscarriage rate, which I would argue is not uh, my experience. My experience is not that, uh, that we have a 48 percent miscarriage rate. So I'm kind of skeptical about the generalizability of the, of the information, but that doesn't matter. It's all done. P less than 0 .0001, and, uh, and the live birth rate is much lower. And that's it. And my poor patients all had to go back on IM progesterone, because if I gave them vaginal, they would say, hey, didn't you read this study? <laughs> so there it is. So when should we start progesterone in artificial cycles? Well. 
first you have to think about what the luteinization threshold is. So the luteinization threshold, meaning there's always progesterone around, right? Even in the follicular phase, prog is about 0 0.5, 0 0.6, and that's not doing anything. Uh, and of course, if it's above 10 or 20, then of course you're getting full luteinization. So somewhere in there has to be a threshold that you need to reach in order for luteinization to take place. And without belaboring the data too much, somewhere around three nanograms per mil is probably our luteinization threshold. And if you look at what progesterone does in natural cycles, the proj level is about one nanogram per mil at the time of ovulation, and it takes 12 to 24 hours after ovulation to get there. If you want to see the data, you have to go all the way back to 1983, which is when people were doing this kind of thing. And the progesterone levels are down at the bottom. It's the, it's the lowest graph that starts with the white dots, and it sort of passes through. Z zero hours is the beginning of the LH surge. And then you see a little plateau there at about 1,000 picograms. That's one nanogram per mil. And that goes on until about 36 hours after the onset of the LH surge. And only then does it go up. So it doesn't hit three nanograms per mil until about 48 hours after the onset of the LH surge, which is 12 to 24 hours after ovulation. So progesterone does not start to act in a natural cycle until quite a while after ovulation, 12 to 24 hours. So why are we starting progesterone on the morning of ovulation in the recipients? That's not, that's not true, right? And some of you are doing modified natural cycles as we are uh, for frozen embryo transfer. You should know if you trigger them with HCG as we do that 36 hours after you give somebody HCG, which is what they did for natural cycle IVF and that's where these data come from, the proj is still really low, 0 0.5. It's actually less than in a cycle where a natural ovulation occurred. So it really takes a long time for that to come up. So there's a, in a natural cycle, the progesterone does not start for at least, at least 24 hours after ovulation. In contrast, in stimulated cycles, of course, progesterone levels are high. In fact, we measure progesterone on the day of HCG frequently. We're doing less and less fresh embryo transfers, but I still do those. And yes, I do respond to if somebody has a high progesterone on the morning of HCG administration and then we freeze all of those. So not to belabor this too much, the natural cycle with endogenous LH surge, one nanogram per mil at ovulation. In a natural cycle with HCG trigger, it's a half a nanogram at the time of ovulation that you would expect. And uh, in a stimulated cycle, it's much higher than that. And if the same person can get pregnant in a stimulated cycle and in a natural cycle, that must mean that the window of implantation is pretty wide, and it's got to be at least 48 to 72 hours. I think that in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this over, but my point is, is that the window of implantation must be wide. So when somebody tries to tell you that you need to advance the time of your progesterone start by 12 hours, you have to say, I'm not sure that that really makes sense to me. So we have said all of this. I said this about endometrial receptivity at the beginning, and that is that the estrogen stimulation is really underappreciated in its role to, uh, to prepare the, uh, the endometrium for progesterone and therefore potentially making uh, that difference. So to repeat all of this, variety of routes of administration for estrogen, oral is the highest metabolism, vaginal has the highest endometrial tissue levels, Transdermal is the most physiologic and duration, really. Short administration is okay, but long administration is also okay if you have somebody who has a thin endometrium. Vaginal versus I am in my heart, I feel there's no difference, but you know, what can I do? There you get I am. One of my favorite high, this is, I got this from uh, Google. The uh, ERA test finds that 25% of IVF frozen transfers occur on the wrong day. And this was the quote. The ERA test found that on a day six embryo transfer would optimize her chances of success. And she credits the ERA and Dr. X for her son, Joshua. So if you need the ERA to tell you to transfer uh, blastases on day six, that's a problem. But you don't need to. You can just follow the physiologic rule and transfer blastases on day six, and that will be, cur that'll be correct. So we'll do it. This is how we do artificial cycles. We don't use GnRH agonists. We use estradiol in the most convenient form, oral or transdermal. Try to get the endometrium to seven. Check serum progesterone prior to starting progesterone. Start progesterone on the evening of ovulation, the synchronous time that way. We use IM and vaginal until we establish the pregnancy, and then we go to vaginal. Transfer the blastocyst on day six. 
you do uh, ovulatory cycles, this is how we do it. Letrozole, five milligrams, time five, day, five days. Once the endometrium is bigger than seven and you have a large follicle, you trigger with HCG. Start supplementing with vaginal progesterone three days after trigger. That means one day after ovulation and then transfer the blastocyst one week after trigger, which is on the sixth day of progesterone. All right, sorry I went over time, but thanks very much. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Dr. Paulson, for that uh, thorough review of a very important topic. Um, next up is um, Dr. Nastran Fayuzi. Um, Dr. Fayuzi is a board certified uh, subspecialist in both reproductive endocrinology and medical genetics by the American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology and the American Board of Medical Genetics and Genomics. Um, she thrives on solving the complex genetics inherent to reproductive failure and considers the result of her efforts, which is healthy children, the greatest reward of her work. Dr. Fayuzi is a reviewer of manuscripts and abstracts for multiple organizations and is a member of ACMG Position Statement Committee on Pre-Implantation Genetic Testing for Polygenic Risk Screening on Embryos. Today, Dr. Fayuzi will discuss how the genetic variations contribute variability in stimulation response. Please welcome Dr. Nastran Fayuzi. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Millie, for the nice introduction. And also, I'm going to thank uh, Sheila and Nabil for uh, inviting me and making this conference happen. Uh, to be honest with you, it's not fair after Dr. Paulson to talk. It's just so tough, so tough. <laughs> so um, the pharmacogenomic, I thought to talk about the pharmacogenomic in ovarian stimulation. and. It is a very, very new area of science in uh, IVF. There are not so much data exists, but I try to, to go through and summarize everything um, to make it work. So I don't have any conflicts of interest. So from the time that uh, Louis Brown uh, were born, it takes about four years now, that the demand for the IVF has been increased dramatically, but the success rate the protocols and medications are still the same. Still uh, 60 to 50% of the uh, stimulated cycle end up to uh, failure of pregnancy. So uh, it's important in this way that to uh, consider some way to personalize and tailor the treatment according to the uh, patient's characteristics uh, through the uh, genetic variability in patients. So what is the pharmacogenetics or pharmacogenomics? Uh, it's a study of the genetic variation in response to the drug treatments. It's a, a very important example form of the uh, basically uh, precision medicine. And uh, the, according to the uh, variability, genetic variability, basically it can uh, uh, has some effect and improvement and balance between the side effects and desired effects of the medication. Uh, from the history standpoint, it basically started from 500 BC. Uh, that was the first time they find out that um, some people, when they get the fava beans, they will develop very severe side effects and they will, uh, some of them, if, uh, uh, die. Uh, then around 18th century, then the hereditary form of the disease uh, and pattern were uh, found out at that point. And the name of pharmacogenomic started to uh, go around around 1957. And uh, in the 20th century, basically the 
huge improvement and uh, breakthrough findings has, has happened, like G6PD, and also uh, finding of the, uh, some association of some genetic abnormality uh, with the patient's characteristic or the disease. Um, the huge revolution was in 2000 to 2003 that uh, they, f they sequenced the human genome. And from that, the, everything has changed in a way that uh, now we have more information with regards to association between our genome, how the physiology works, how the medications work, and why we have so much variability. Um, the JBOS studies, uh, are the cornerstone of pharmacogenomic studies. So how does it work is we divide the patients, one group with the specific phenotype and compare them to the control. First, they basically, these patients, they do the sequencing and go for the SNPs, and then they will find out that the, uh, some of the SNPs are more common, they can see statistically significant in some region, then they can sequence the region to find the candidate gene, and uh, if the um, basically variant, pathogenic variant is more than 1%, then they call it polymorphism, is less than they call it as a mutation. Um, the, the caveat is here, though. In the human disease, J was the effect size is small or it's moderate. And that makes it not very valuable uh, in um, basically understanding of the genetic of the hereditary or the disease because there are so many characteristic of the patient environmental factor that should be in consideration. However, the difference is in pharmacogenomic because it's dichotomous uh, basically uh, variable. So it's yes or no. And by that way, uh, the uh, power and effect size in JWAS study with regards to the pharmacogenomics studies are uh, pretty good. So what are the applications of pharmacogenomic? It can improve the drug safety, can reduce the adverse effect, can uh, tailor the treatment to meet the patient's genetic predisposition and um, find out what is the optimal dose for this patient. It can improve drug discovery uh, and also improve the proof of principle uh, for efficacy uh, studies. So, how does the pharmacogenomic work? The, there are good association between the pharmacogenomic, pharmacodynamic, and uh, pharmacokinetic. The genetic variability in each person can determine what is the metabolism distribution or absorption of the, uh, of the uh, drug. For example, if the cell has more um, receptors, then they, the response is more. If they have less receptor, the response is less. Or the uh, other things is drug uh, breakdown. If the enzyme metabolized faster, and they are fast metabolizer, then you need to give the uh, medication either more frequently or you have to increase the dose. And if they are the slow uh, metabolizer, then definitely you have to decrease the dose of medication in the patients. And also drug uptake, it uh, has another you know, effect on pharmacokinetic. How many receptors can, can go and uptake by the cells? If, for example, this number is l low, means that lower amount of the medication goes inside the cells, so we are gonna see the uh, adverse effect of the medication according to the uh, genetic variability and how the gene express uh, of the receptors and enzyme activity on tissue. Now, with regards to the um, controlled ovarian hyperstimulation, I'm sure all of you saw many patients that ovarian reserve is very good, they go through stimulation, very unexpectedly very poor response. Or you have a, somebody who doesn't have a very good AMH or AFC, but they go through stimulation, and unexpectedly makes us happy, and we get so many eggs. Why this happens? Uh, why some people develop OHSS and some people don't. And honestly, I have seen even with the estrogen of 3,000 or 2,500 OHSS, which shouldn't happen. So these are all the questions that could be responded and answered by study on the um, genetic variability on human and its association with the controlled ovarian hyperstimulation. Uh, 
And also it can help us to um, tailor the medication for each patient. This is the um, slide that shows the most common um, polymorphism that has been studied um, in, associa uh, in association with the um, COH or uh, outcome in IVF treatment. I'm not gonna go through all of them. Uh, the main one is the FSHR uh, polymorphism. Um, and a receptor of FSH, as you know, it's one of them that has been studied most than any other, um, um, basically, polymorphism. And uh, the uh, physiological action of the FSH really depends on the uh, activation of the receptor and uh, usually this expressed by granulosa cells. Now, uh, there are, um, between all of the studies, there are two uh, variation or polymorphism that constantly, when they uh, studied, hit the target and showed that these are, this polymorphism are associated with the different response or variability. One of them is the uh, position of 307, alanine to treonine, and um, another one is the uh, aspergine 680 to serine. And it, both of this polymorphism in patients were associated with the lower uh, response to the treatment. However, if we have in, for example, um, a position of 68, um, we have serine, serine, serine 68, serine, then it will cause OHSS, and the study has shown that these are the patients could be used as a marker to predict who's gonna develop the OHSS. Um, also, not only that, the 307 treonine to alanine has been shown that not only uh, the duration of the stimulation is um, longer, the amount of the FSH that this patient needs is higher, the amount of the uh, matured egg in these people are, are lower, fertilization lower, and also the blast formation are lower. And basically, these two uh, polymorphism, when they are together, then even the pregnancy rate will be dropped. Um, the um, gain of function mutation usually are the one that makes the, for example, in FSH receptor to work more, right? Um, these are majority of the time happens in the extra uh, cellular domain of the receptor. And when this happens, usually they uh, work like a autosomal dominant. However, the um, poor responders uh, or inactivating or loss of function polymorphism, usually they happen in through all the three parts of the receptor, and therefore they have to be the um, most, most, they are autosomal recessive, means that you have to have two different genetic variants or compound heterozygous uh, to have the uh, phenotype. This slide shows that the most uh, actionable um, and functional uh, pharmacogenomic variants in FSHR gene. Majority of the um, deletions uh, and loss of functions happens in the exon number seven and exon number 10. Um, now, let's look at the uh, different of um, the changes that could happen in the receptor. For example, if we have the uh, polymorphism in the exon two splice side, um, in the splice side, that can delete the exon two on the FSH receptor, then we are going to have the poor responder and lower response compared to the wild type. Another one is the leucine-rich region in uh, FSH um, receptor that affects the extra domain, and therefore it will affect the binding of the um, ligand to the receptors and affect the response and therefore the availability of the medications. Now, if you look at the, um, this two polymorphism, one is basically in the a polymorphism in the region of the 6165 that uh, has the uh, basic substitution of the A to G in position of 919. And they find out that if we have a homozygote of AA in this group, uh, they have much better response this patient compared to the 
any other alternative, and uh, they got the more retrieved uh, uh, OSI during the simulation. And um, there, uh, another one is in 61, 66 in the close to the tree prime region, and they find out that the GG homozygote of this patient had a higher level of FSH than the other forms. But when you look in the PCOS patient, but when you look at this polymorphism in non-PCOS patients, then it will show that the same polymorphism could cause a poor response. The, um, also, another important one is the uh, uh, polymorphism that affects the uh, 29 base before the uh, exo number one, and it has been shown that it's uh, associated with the uh, function, uh, low functionality and gene expression. Basically, the amount of the receptor expression on the cell surface will be decreased in these people. The recently a novel variant of FSHR receptor has been shown, and that's the one that uh, basically um, changed the isoleucine in a position of 423 to treonine, and this affect the second transmembrane uh, domain and uh, affect the uh, basically membrane expression of the uh, FSHR. Now, the importance of this was that when you have this polymorphism, this uh, affects selectively the CAMP pathways of the uh, FSH receptor and the uh, two other ERK1 and two uh, and uh, arisin less will be affected. So as you see, the genetic variability and these variations, although they are in infancy, but they can show us that these are going to be the future. Then we can personalize accordingly the dose of medication and also how to manipulate different pathways in order to get the better response in these patients. Um, this is what this all I, I talked was about receptor. Now let's talk about the ligand. Are, are they going to affect as well or not? I'm going to touch very quickly on uh, natural FSH or human FSH. All of you know it has two alpha subunit and beta subunits. Uh, the alpha subunit has the 92 uh, amino acid uh, and also some sugars added to this part. And a beta subunit has 111 amino acid and also it has uh, some sugar uh, parts. The, uh, on the top of the sugar parts of the uh, alpha and beta subunits, usually sialic acid will be added that it will change the acidity and also the uh, half-life and effectivity of the medications. Now, if we have the fully glycosylated FSH, they call it as uh, FSH24, um, and this has usually difference in expression throughout the female reproductive life. The two other form of the FSH, one FSH18 and the other is uh, FSH21, they have two glycosylation. And then, uh, so they have less acidic form. So these are also our different expression throughout the life. When we are younger, the amount of the ratio of 21 to 24 FSH is higher. As much as we go through the reproductive life, this ratio will change and FSH24 will be added. More glycosylated and more acidic, so different uh, physiology and different action. Um, the, um, that means that, that, that I said, that means that uh, when we are in mo uh, menopause, usually we have highly acidic um, uh, human FSH. The FSH of uh, 21 and 18 diglycosylated, they are much stronger in attachment to the uh, receptor and activation of the receptors. Now, this slide, I just, I, don't be scared, I'm not gonna go through all of it. It's just uh, showing that what are the synthetic form of the S FSH is available, and what is their difference with human? So if you look, there is a gonal F, uh, which has the alpha subunits, there is a beta uh, folotropin that these two are the majority of the time that we are using. They have, a, all of them, they have two glycosylation. They are less acidic, 
And um, when we compare with the uh, uh, physiologic uh, amount of the FSH, they have different uh, property uh, and half-life. They are less acidic compared to the natural one. Also, not on, uh, only this, they activate the different pathways. In human uh, uh, FSH, for example, if you consider that um, um, menopore compared to follis. First of all, follis is 95% pure. Menopore, only 5% pure. And the, of course, the response of the patients are going to be a different because uh, the uh, human one has, is more acidic. Uh, menopore is more acidic than the um, uh, recombinant FSH. Now, in normal situation, the pathway that usually will be activated is CAMP pathway. Arrestin, ERK1, and 2 are the secondary pathway. When they use the gonal F with the hormonal and physiological dose, they find out that it doesn't activate the CAMP. They have to increase the dose of medication, the uh, mm, potency of the medication in order to be able to activate the uh, pathway. And majority of the time, it was preferable to be activated through ERK1 and um, arrestin 2 So this means that we are activating the different pathways in, um, but with the different preparation that we have. And this also could have the different uh, effect on response to the uh, treatment in different patients. So what are the problems that we have now with regards to the pharmacogenomic studies in IVF and ovarian stimulation? One, there are not so many JWAS studies. Few JWAS studies have been done. Sample number is very low. And it has been calculated that if, uh, when we are assuming the common SNP variant to explain about 3.4% uh, change in the response on the treatment in IVF, we, at least we, not, we need 1,000 samples. None of the JWAS study had this number. And we don't have enough number even to do the meta-analysis and find out. So one thing that I'm saying and I'm calling is having more JWAS study uh, to have more data with regards to that. Also, the other things that the population heterogeneity in uh, different studies, uh, cost of genetic testing, it's huge. Um, in some way, if the pharmacogenomic going to be a part of the precision medicine and our, our everyday practice, the pro there should be some way that they, they could, we could bring the price down. Another part is the difficulty in interpretation of the results because it's early in infancy. There are heterogeneous results that we are seeing. So it means that calling for more research to be done, to have more consistent data to be able to interpret, and also uh, train the physician to know how to interpret these results. The last things is the important things that the nature of the response in COS is really polygenic. At the end, I want to say that the uh, pharmacogenomic studies eventually lead to the error that um, DNA sequencing of the uh, patients become integral part of the determinant of the drug uh, therapy. So this is going to happen. What we need is to call for more specific, more studies and research, and don't focus only to make the FSH that we are all the time using with the same. We have to understand more physiology of the human to understand what each pathways, when they will be activated, what is the results? And the answer is not increasing the dose. Whenever we increase the dose, it doesn't mean that we are getting the favorable results. And that means that we need really uh, more study in pharmacogenomic uh, aspects and science of the ART. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Foyuzi, for your pioneer research. And I feel that now we have more responsibility when planning for a treatment for a patient. <laughs> uh, 
So up next, we have Dr. William Frigi. Yes. Uh, Dr. William Frigi graduated from Tufts University School of Medicine and completed his OBGYN residency at the Los Angeles County University of Southern California Medical Center. He completed a fellowship in REI at the University of Texas. After fellowship, he completed a doctorate in human genetics at the University of California, Los Angeles. His passion is in genomic medicine, and he has used new genetic technologies to interrogate basic clinical questions. Over the last eight years, he has been providing clinical care, sorry, clinical care in private practice in Encino, California, and at the Reproductive Sciences Medical Center in San Diego, California. He is currently the medical and laboratory directors of the Envita Fertility Center in Laguna Hills, California. So, Dr. Freyji will discuss the novel uses of medroxyprogesterone acetate in controlled ovarian stimulation. Please, everybody, give a warm welcome to Dr. Fridge. <laughs> Do I use this microphone here? Can everyone hear me? Or is it the uh, one on the... Oh, right here? Okay, okay, <laughs> very fine. Okay, I, I wanna thank uh, Dr. Raj for inviting me to speak here today. Um, and I just wanna share with everyone here that um, I'm a basic scientist at heart. Um, I was at UCLA for many years where I directed a laboratory where we looked at intrauterine growth restriction and, and looking at the epigenetic modifications um, and that's a really neat model because it brings together nutrition, metabolism, genetics, and epigenetics. Um, life took me down some different pathways, so I've been doing clinical medicine over the last eight years. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about some of the experiences I've had over the last few years using um, medroxyprogesterone acetate during controlled ovarian stimulation. Um, I wanna say that when I finished my fellowship in 1999, I was in awe of genetics. It was right before the human genome had been fully sequenced. Um, new genomic technologies like microarrays were first becoming available. And I was in awe then, and I'm in awe today. I mean, we have microfluidic platforms, we have optical sequencing, we understand about higher order chromatin structure. Um, it's just a really, really exciting time to be involved in medicine and in genetics. So with that background, I'll start talking about a very clinical thing. Um, and let's see. Forgive me, oh, here we go, okay. So um, I have no disclosures to the group here. Um, now, it's been long known that progestins suppress um, gonadotropin release. It's the basic mechanism of oral contraceptive pills. It's also used in progestin-only contraception, uh, which we predominantly give after uh, delivery. Uh, it's the mechanism operative with Depo-Provera, and so it, it provides a very inexpensive, easy way to suppress gonadotropin secretion. Um, why we didn't use it before? When, before we had vitrification techniques, we had to transfer fresh, and giving a progestin early would certainly derail the whole endeavor. So um, now that we use vitrification techniques, some forward-thinking researchers out of China and Israel thought to use progestins to, 
to suppress the LH surge. This was published in 2015 in Fertility and Sterility. And um, there are 280 publications on this now. It's a, it's a very common um, protocol used internationally. Amongst my colleagues and some of the fellows that I've trained, they didn't even know about some of this. So that's why I thought it would be interesting to share it with the group today. Um, the name that the, the moniker that they've given is called progestin primed ovarian stimulation. It's not really priming; it's co-treatment. But that's what if you if you look it up, this is how you would reference the literature. And um, the initial publication used 10 milligrams of medroxyprogesterone acetate concurrent with gonadotropin stimulation, and the control group was a short agonist. Um, and what they found was that it was non-inferior to a short agonist protocol. There was longer stimulation days, and there ended up being a higher estradiol level in the medroxyprogesterone group. This is a figure taken from that um, publication. Uh, on the upper left panel are levels of FSH over the uh, uh, stimulation time. On the bottom panel is the uh, bottom left is the estradiol. And what we can, in, what's the most important is the upper right panel. That, are, that is LH levels over the stimulation cycle. And, you, and it's apparent that actual levels go down of LH when you co-administer medroxyprogesterone acetate at 10 milligrams. The bottom panel is progesterone levels. Also from that publication, the duration of HMG was eight days in the control group, nine days in the study group. And uh, the peak estradiol levels were 2,000 in the Provera group as opposed to 1,600 in the control group. Oh, let me just go back. On the bottom, they found no difference in the number of 10 millimeter follicles, 14 millimeter follicles, um, oocytes retrieved, M2 oocytes, fertilized oocytes, cleaved embryos, dot, dot, dot. But I put in yellow, the incidence of premature LH surges are not increased. When do you start it? Well, the, the time for the optimal um, suppression of LH during the stimulation is if you start it with the first day of gonadotropin treatment. And they reference some unpublished data in that paper, which says if you start in the mid-follicular phase that it will um, not suppress as well. Um, there's really not a lot of literature when the Provera is, street, is started in the mid-follicular phase, at least none that I could find to review. Uh, they state to start it when we have a, a baseline of 50 to 70 picograms per ml of estradiol. And they have gone on to publish many, many other papers. Um, and they describe a flexible protocol where there's transient use of a gonadotropin um, antagonist followed by uh, the administration of um, medroxyprogesterone acetate. They went on to show that it's effective in polycystic ovary syndrome, endometriosis, poor responders, as well as asynchronous follicular cohorts. And as I said earlier, there's 280 publications on this. Um, they've also looked at different types of progestins, Didrogesterone, not available here, but internationally available, is effective. Progesterone itself is effective. And um, overall, the medroxyprogesterone acetate is probably the most um, widely studied and uh, where the most data is. Uh, they, the, the original authors went back to a study in 1984 to figure out what the effective dose is to prevent LH surges, and that was determined to be 10 milligrams. Um, however, studies in the last few years have shown that four milligrams is effective in preventing the LH surges. And I said different, different um, progesterones are all effective. 
Now, this was where I kind of, my interest was piqued, is like, how can we know what this is doing to the follicular genesis? Uh, what, are, what, what, what happens when the progesterone is given during um, the growth of the follicles? And my, th I think it is my third, the second, second one is that the modeling is very complicated. Um, some studies have been done looking at human granulosa cells, directed animal studies, conditional knockout models, RU486, immortalized cell lines, looking at uh, reporter constructs. And um, there really isn't a clear um, uh, synthesizing the effect of progesterone during follicular genesis is not clear. Uh, we all know that there's two receptors, the PRA and the PRB, as well as there's um, membrane receptors. And we know that the nuclear translocation of the progesterone receptor uh, can be immunolocalized to the theca of small antral follicles and granulosa cells of preovulatory follicles that are expo exposed to HCG. There needs to be nuclear translocation of the progesterone receptor for ovulation. And um, progesterone effects is that it, it can uh, suppress primordial follicular genesis through slowing granulosa growth. And that is probably why the cycle length is increased when it's used. So um, I had patients asking me about this protocol. I, I've taken care of a lot of international patients. So I was asked, uh, well, do you use progestin? Um, do you use the PPOS protocol, and my first answer was no, I, I don't know that much about it. So I decided that I was gonna try it out. And so between September of 2021 and just last month, I used it in 19 IVF cycles in 16 patients. Um, now, this is not a randomized study. It is me deciding when I could use it, and when I thought that it would be useful for a patient. Um, I'm not going to be able to prove anything one way or another, but I do find that it is a useful adjunct in our armamentarium of medications. Um, when did I select it? When patients had a high basal level of LH, um, or they had LH levels in the, after a few days of stimulation, if they had elevated LH levels, then I would start it. I would say that I've done this in a minority of my patients. Um, I, I usually use a GNRH antagonist. Rarely do I use a short agonist protocol, and rarely also a long agonist protocol. So this begs the question of when do we start the GNRH antagonist? And there it is, the guidelines are somewhat arbitrary. Um, some literature, well, if you look at the package insert, it says, after stimulation days five or six, or when the follicles reach about 13 millimeters, or when the estradiol levels are above 500 picograms per ml for an extended time. Um, now, I've had the, the, the um, I've worked with different colleagues over the last eight years. How each of them use the antagonist and when they start it is very <laughs> different. And um, I, I, uh, as an aside, I think that the GnRH antagonist is a phenomenal treatment. It brings down LH levels. It suppresses it um, almost too much. So um, I'm, I oftentimes will give either half doses or quarter doses of antagonist. Um, it's available at a three milligram dose, but the standard daily dose is 250 micrograms. Um, I prefer cetratide because it's easier to be um, divided into subdoses, but both Ganarelix and cetratide are equally effective. Um, and yeah. I look at the antagonist dosing similar to estrogen dosing. It should be given for the lowest amount of time at the lowest dose. I think that gives the highest quality oocytes. 
Um, I think that if you give too much antagonist early, you can suppress follicular growth, and if you give it too late, you can have premature luteinization. So I went into this thinking, could I balance the dose and duration of the antagonist by the use of medroxyprogesterone acetate? And um, I always think it's fun to see how other doctors do things, so I've included three panels of representative patients, and um, here is a stimulation cycle. Um, let me just look at my notes here. This is a 33-year-old woman with secondary infertility. Her AMH was 1.8. She failed an IVF cycle at a prestigious uh, clinic back east. She was obese with a BMI of 32. I put her on a luteal esterase pretreatment, and um, I put her at 450 units of gonadotropins um, based on her body weight. She was started concurrently with the medroxyprogesterone acetate. Um, on the first day of stimulation, and the reason I put this one up here is I want to show you that it went to 13, 14 days stimulation. It is pretty much unheard of for me to go that long with a cycle, and of course it irritated my embryologist because this, this you know, week after week I was doing Saturday retrievals. Um, so it does, on average, prolong the length of the cycle. Um, let's see. LH levels range between 1.2 to 4.8, and also 1.5 to 1.8. Peak estradiol was 2,481. I triggered her with a dual trigger, which I don't usually do, but I had ordered her the, the uh, agonist, thinking that she was going to go higher than 3,000. She got 10,000 units of HCG as well as the uh, agonist. Uh, we got six M2 oocytes. They grew out four blastocysts, of which three were euploid. She became pregnant. This was one of the first patients that I did. This was back in, in um, June of 2022. Now, this is an, another stimulated cycle that I wanted to share. This is a 32-year-old nulla gravida with an AMH of 13.1. I put her on a pretreatment of two and a half weeks of birth control pills. Her antral follicle count was 27. Her baseline LH was 9.4. I started her on 325 units of gonadotropins with concurrent medroxyprogesterone acetate, 10 milligrams. Um, she had an unusually short cycle, as you can see. It went to eight, nine days. Uh, peak estradiol was 4,568. Um, I did add a quarter dose of the antagonist for the last two days just because I didn't want to take the chance that there might be a premature surge. But I want to just share with you that, um, that you don't need to use a lot of antagonist once again. 18 oocytes were retrieved, 16 M2, 11 blastocysts, 8 euploids. First embryo transfer was an embryonic gestation. Second was an ongoing pregnancy, and she's gone, gone on to deliver. Okay. Last patient. I did this patient just back in April. 34-year-old um, year old nulla gravida. Failed two IVF cycles at a local program. Um, um, the first that she failed was an antagonist. The second was a microdose Lupron. I put her on luteal esterase. Um, I put her on 500 units of gonadotropins, which is a little bit unusual, but she's 160 pounds. And her, base, um, her, her LH over the treatment rose to six after two days of meds. So I put in, I started the um, medroxyprogesterone at that point. Um, LH has remained between 5 and 5.2. She got half-dose antagonist for four days. Peak estradiol was 1370. We got seven oocytes, seven M2s, three blastocysts, two of which were euploid. So, I need to wrap this up. So 16 patients, 19 cycles. 
I, my feeling is that the number of oocytes collected were correlated with the number of mature follicles. Uh, 14 patients underwent IVF, two were planned oocyte cryopreservation. I don't like to do this with oocyte cryopreservation because I want to know what the outcomes are now, but those two patients had LH profiles that seemed optimal for this treatment. 12 of the 14 patients undergoing IVF cultured euploid embryos. The two patients that did not culture euploid embryos really had unfavorable characteristics. One was 43, one had a unilateral salpingo-oophorectomy previously. Um, eight of the IVF patients have undergone 11 embryo transfers and six have either ongoing pregnancies or have delivered. Um, so I don't think it sacrifices embryo quality or implantation potential. So I think it's an inexpensive pharmacologic agent that can prevent premature LH surges. Uh, if you want to be most sure of its effectivity, start it on the first day of stimulation. Um, the optimal patient would be someone with a high antral follicle count, a high AMH, and high basal levels of LH. Um, anticipate that you'll have one more day of stimulation before you start. Um, I think it does limit the duration and total dose of the antagonist that you give, and I don't think it affects cumulative live birth rate. There is evidence in the literature that there's no adverse fetal or neonatal outcomes. Cost effectivity, it might be effective if you, um, since we have to freeze the embryos, it makes it more expensive. Um, so you, you have to kind of look at the cost-effective analysis depending on how you're going to approach it. And I want to um, acknowledge Dr. Raj and, of course, my, my colleague at Reproductive Sciences Medical Center. So thank you all. So we are going to open for the discussion after these insightful lectures with these renowned specialists. Yes. Thank you. I hope I'm not boring you with my questions. I'll try to speak louder, too. Uh, um, my question goes for the last lecturer. And you, you just showed how what we do is really more an art, right? Playing with what we do is an art, manipulating different doses. My question for you is, do you have much use with Aurelisa? I tend to use that, especially in my self pay patients, because it's so much cheaper than using Ganorelix and I don't have to use the full pack like they would use for endometriosis. Um, do you have much experience with that? I have not, no, but thank you for sharing. Right, I got that from Dr. Schnorr from Pacific, was it, in uh, the donor conference? Because they use that a lot. So when I went there and I said, oh wow, wonderful, and I started using it and, and playing with it. Some insurance may not pay for it, but for self-pay patients, it just lowers their price. By a lot. And Dr. Schnorr's paper is coming out in this month's Fertility and Sterility Reports to uh, use a shameless plug for uh, the journal. Hi, I'm Lei uh, uh working in kind of body. Uh, I'm very interested in, in the uh, pharmacogenetics. Uh, uh, here, uh, the lecturer only introduced that uh, uh, this kind of drugs uh, all uh, affected the stimulation uh, 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 outcomes. But uh, in the clinic, uh, in the real uh, practice, we also realized that some uh, uh, different uh, stimulation plans also uh, affect the outcomes of the Ambrose uh, employee 
rate and the annual employee rate. Do you have any uh, research uh, about this? With regards to pharmacogenomics, no, there was nothing. But um, you're right. In the practice, we see some changes. But when you look at the um, whole data outside with regards to different protocols for poor responder, honestly, none of them was superior to the others. That's the literature says. So, um, but I didn't see anything in, in pharmacogenomic studies with regards to uh, different medication uh, better um, better the uh, response. The only part was the variability in two polymorphism that I said in the FSH receptors uh, was one of them was in the position of 307. Um, that was the one that showed when people have this kind of uh, polymorphism, there are more mature oocyte and more blast formation, but the pregnancy rate wasn't different. Could you actually elaborate on how it is that the different FSH isoforms activate different pathways? I did not understand that. They, they bind to FSH receptors. Correct. But yet they so, activate different pathways. Yes, through the G, uh, G receptor, G coupled. So the physiological situation of uh, the human one, it activates the CMP through the G alpha. But because for the um, synthetic form, we have to use higher dose, that doesn't uh, activate through the G alpha. It goes to the supraphysiological um, those and uh, GQI will be activated. Therefore, that two pathway of ERK and atestin 2 will be activated uh, as a predominant one. Then should we be using a combination of either Lupron or Clomid or something that will stimulate endogenous FSH production in addition to giving exogenous FSH to activate both pathways? So th that's a very good um, but the only things that I'm saying that we are using the higher than physiological dose in order to activate the, these two pathways, right? Um, they didn't see that the physiological um, dose, um, the hormone, amount of the hormone, when you get to that, um, basically, 20 units of the human FSH, and you give the 20 units of the folostim, it's not going to activate in, in vivo at all the... Uh, CAMP pathway. So they have to use higher dose to be able to activate. Now, if you are thinking about the increasing the dose, yes, you can activate the other uh, pathway as well, but then you are also in a very, very supraphysiological dose. And I, what I'm arguing that if we are personal, if we look at this polymorphism, Maybe we don't need at all to go through with such a high dose. If, the, if they could enough study happen, they could uh, design a medication that only activate with the more physiological part rather than the other. Of course, if you are adding the Clomid or HMG or something that has more um, the other, basically um, uh, activate the other pathway, we are going to get the response, but then oversaturating. We are over, much more than over the physiological dose. Any other questions? Yes, once again, Luis Rualcaba from Mexico. Professor William, I read a, a very nice paper of Antonio Lamarca from Italy doing a great comparison between the dose, the progestin, and the oocyte quality. Did you find any uh, change of uh, oocyte quality using medoroxyprogesterone? My experience was no, no. I had a follow-up question to that. Uh, Dr. Friji, did you have any change in like the aneuploidy status of the embryos? Did you see, is, is, is it comparable? I have small numbers, okay. But I didn't think that there was any difference. Um, I don't have any statistical studies. It's just a small study. Um, but I, sh I shared with the group the ratio of euploid as opposed to how many were biopsied. And they were all within what I would expect. Great. I have another question. Uh, how do you see this individualized treatment on reproductive medicine 
versus this increasing amount of cycles, uh, these huge clinics where companies that are very worried with business are buying these companies, and how do you see this? this it's kind of conflicting. Um, if, let me see if I understand your question right. So you're saying that if we do the personalized medicine, the patient needs lower cycle, and that's not going to be uh, business savvy. Over it, no, I, I mean, it's sometimes it's, it can be difficult to individualize if you have a huge amount of cycles of patients. Oh, you mean so. that the... the so the, absolutely, this is, this is right. Uh, still, we are not... We are still in infancy of this personal of the pharmacogenomic in COS. So much should have been done, and um, it's not going to come in the next five six years, I don't think. But of course, if we know that which polymorphism uh, hit all the time, and also um, know much better the pathways inside and association with that polymorphism with the phenotype, then you can at least for the full responder to have, okay, if like we are checking AMH, before even getting to the uh, steam, you can check that polymorphism and see that, oh, she has that, so then maybe we, I need a higher dose or maybe I need a different medication for her. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Paulson, Dr. Fridge, any comment on this question? Because, of course, now we are talking specifically about pharmacogenetics, but sometimes also there are other uh, kinds of personalizing the treatment. Well, I think it's fascinating. I, honestly, I think it's... and the. I mean, my mind reels that we could study all the patients that develop OHSS and see if they demonstrate these polymorphisms or not, and if we could actually eliminate OHSS. Well, we've sort of eliminated it by using Lupron trigger anyway, but the, there are still patients who develop, who develop OHSS, and to know that they all, or a ma majority of them, have a polymorphism, that would be very, that would be very interesting. Yeah, there are even case reports of people developing hyperstimulation with fairly minimal stimulation. There are reports, for example, of people having spontaneous ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome without any stimulation. Uh, we had a paper on somebody getting OHSS and actually a vertebral artery thrombosis who had Clomid. So there are uh, sort of outliers that I think would be so... It's what an interesting way to study them and try to evaluate them. I agree. There are these outlier patients that we rarely come across. Um, I'll never forget when I was a young attending, my chairman left town and I was in charge of his patients and this woman had full-blown hyperstimulation, was very ill. Her estrile wasn't that high, um, 3,000. Um, it took a lot of intensive care. And then when my chairman left to go back east to the NIH, I inherited her. And I said, oh, this time we're going to do it really mild. We're going to keep the estradiol under 2,000. And sure enough, I kept the estradiols under 2,000, but she had hyperstimulation. So, you know, identifying those unique patients and then subjecting them to the GWAS would be a really fascinating um, thing. And then the other thing that I'm thinking about with hyperstimulation is that Really, the culprit is HCG, you know. Um, back in November, there was a shortage of Menopure. So I was giving patients some exogenous low-dose HCG, and I very rarely get hyperstimulation. I had three patients right at that time because I'd given them low-dose HCG. So HCG is really, it, it is the dangerous part of this whole equation. I just wanted to add quickly before your question, Dr. Ali. Um, I think the way I envision it is that all of these polygenic diseases that we take care of in reproductive medicine are going to be very quickly addressed. So endometriosis, PCOS, male factor, unexplained infertility, and the ovarian reserve are all in the same category of polygenic diseases. And with the advent of or easy availability of these genetic technologies with the desire of industry and you know some pioneers in clinical setting who will test those out 
I envisioned that we would have a patient come in for uh, evaluation. The doctor will do the history, physical exam, their testing for um, fertility, and then also a chip. They will do a blood draw, get the report out, and it will also involve artificial intelligence that will be learning as, as all of that is happening, and then you will be presenting the patient in a scaled way with uh, ovulation stimulation, their trigger, so everything will be streamlined in a, such a fascinating way that you could do a high throughput scaled treatment of a lot of patients in a very personalized way. And it's coming, uh, like I was asking in the morning, it's coming very quickly. We should be prepared, we should be reading, we should be testing. I think as, as uh, people in the field that are here right now, this is an exciting time. That's exactly uh, where my question was leading. So you hit the nail right on the head. We do need, um, we just had a segment on AI, which was incredibly robust. So to continue with that conversation, how AI can help now, not only in the lab, not only in our you know, screening and diagnostic testing, but also in reproductive medicine, really in every department of reproductive medicine. Now, it, I, I think we're in a very unique space where we're combating high volume and low staffing. And so AI is um, very much needed and desired at this point. How do, you, uh, how do you envision standardizing and making more efficient stimulation cycles? So for example, gonadotropin doses, the days of stimulation, because all of that factors into you know, financial, um, a financial burden for the patient, but also an emotional burden. So you, um, you're, you know, there were there was a presentation, Dr. Friji, you had up that you had different dosages for patients based on their characteristics, which made appropriate sense for the patient. Um, but, you know, as far as the emotional burden on the patient, it, do you think that that's variable when patients are on super physiological doses that are much higher than the next patient? Sometimes, even in the same patient, you know, uh, total dose gonadotropins may be so much higher. Um, in the second cycle compared to the first cycle based on the response of her first cycle if it, if it was negative. So w can you just comment on if these genetic testings become available, how would you feel about um, modifying that stimulation and how would you how would you make that change? Because even in one clinic, um, the data is available to you, but how often is it uh, compiled, or how often do you group together to look at your stimulation practices, not only within the clinic, but between one one uh, doctor to another, or between one type of patient, like PCO patient, compared to um, you know a patient that has preliminary ovarian failure. So, would you comment on the practices and how AI may change that with the addition of genetic testing? Well, we have multiple pieces of data coming in, and it becomes a superhuman challenge to uh, identify the wheat from the chaff. So I think the AI can really help us with that. Um, you know, there's, at the end of the day, though, there's no substitute for a human being crunching the data. And I mean, I remember when I was a graduate student, I'd be up till one and two in the morning looking at genomic data. And that's oftentimes how g genomic um, reports are issued. There's still a person at the end of the day looking at the data, identifying what are the most viable candidates and what are variants of undetermined significance. Maybe AI will be able to um, confirm that, do better. I mean, it's all going to be something that we're going to learn together. But I, at the end of the day, I think there has to be a responsible person looking at the data saying, does it make sense? Is there a hypothesis in there? Is this, is this real? Just as one comment, um, when you look at pharmac uh, pharmacogenomic studies, Typically, they are done on a population, a, most likely the biobanks are European population, and then they're looking at general population, trying to solve a problem that is very specific to fertility. So what happens is that, you know, 
I think the solution to getting uh, enough data to run all these algorithms and, and predict, have some sort of prediction model is that the fertility clinics themselves have to participate. So if you have patients that have struggled with the, with the, with the fertility, infertility and the treatment did not solve that problem, the best thing to do is to have them participate in, a, in a, you know, providing their, their DNA as a, as a, for a biobank participation. So if you have a scenario, we have a large, because we're talking about studies where you pull 100,000, and 100,000 patients is not a lot in, in whole genome association study. And so imagine, that, I think that's where the bottleneck is, because figuring out the, the genomic or genetic variation that correlates with, the, with, with certain uh, you know, infertility traits that is just a, a, a matter of uh, bioinformatic comp combined with AI. But the source of limitation is the, pop the population is not the right one that we're looking at. I completely agree with you. And that was exactly the point of my talk, to, to call for all of the uh, geneticists, all of the REI to work together and uh, make this kind of study happen. Mm -hmm. Um, and remove the mentality, oh, okay, I'm going to increase the dose and increase the cycle, I'm going to get to this, to that. That's not an answer, just increasing the dose. I think we have to understand what is the problem in this, or what is the polymorphism that this patient has, that the response is not the way that we want it, and resolve that. And absolutely, I agree with you, Nabil, that this, it's important that all of the REI and clinics take part to tailor and make the protocols basically in a better way. And I just wanted to add to that, I completely agree with Dr. Fayuzi. Recently, the Pan Genome Project was completed. So 47 different individuals were sequenced end to end for their SNPs, it's available, it's free for all. So I think it's exponential increase is coming. We just have to participate from the IVF field. So we are at a cusp of where um, the corporations are moving high amounts of IVF, which their focus is to take a lot of cycles together. But we as scientists and um, physicians and embryologists and everybody in the field have to be mindful of what's happening in the science piece of it so we can take all those patients in a new era. Like it, things are going to change very quickly is my personal opinion. I will see in the next few meetings how it pans out. Yes. So I learned that time is over. So I really want to thank you all for your participation. It was an insightful discussion, very wonderful section. And thank you the audience for your presence and your participation. We really appreciate. And now we have a happy moment. It's lunch time. <laughs>
get things started uh, for the afternoon session. Uh, so we've heard a little bit about AI automation, uh, endocrinology. We're going to focus a bit more here on the lab and hear about some best practices and, and other aspects. And we've got the pleasure of having three very well respected, very accomplished uh, lab directors. So uh, lots of opportunity here to ask some good questions and learn. And so, uh, yeah, uh, please take advantage. So our first speaker falls certainly into that category, Dr. Sangeeta uh, Jindal, uh, PhD HCLD, got her PhD uh, in Toronto and has now been the lab director at uh, Einstein in New York for the last uh, 20 plus years. And a very accomplished uh, on-site lab director there, off-site lab director in uh, several other locations, has published over 130 articles, is the president of SART, has been long active with various groups at ASRM. Um, very amazing educator uh, and uh, trainer, a big advocate uh, for embryologists and training embryologists in the labs. And personally, I would say as important, if not important, she's a great person, um, uh, uh, very good friend, and, and just personally, on a, a personal note, uh, she should get a medal for this alone. She operates labs in New York and Florida and has been a huge help to me over the years trying to navigate regulatory in those states if, as we have opened up labs there, and she's done so uh, uh, very successfully. So that alone deserves a round of applause. So here's Dr. Jindal to talk to us about cancel culture. Outcomes from the second stimulation cycle. <clears throat> and, uh, and also applause for a very clever title. So. Oh, thank you. I definitely paid him to say that, all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, my husband's actually um, worked in advertising, and he comes up with all these catchphrases and titles, but I came up with this one. Um, so yes, yeah, so thank you so much. Oh my god, I have no notes. Seriously? Slight disaster. I need my notes. Um, so thank you so much to Sheila and Nabil and all the organizers and sponsors of this meeting, these regional meetings. Uh, now we have quite a few of them, and they're terrific for small group format and learning from leaders and sharing content and meeting people. Um, I think it's really great, so um, I encourage you all to participate as much as you can. So the title of my talk, obviously, um, Cancel Culture, IVF Outcomes from Second Stimulation Cycles Following First Cycle Cancellation. <clears throat> and this was a topic I was given, and I really didn't know what I was going to talk about. And it turns out I actually have some original data to show you, which I'll share with you today. And this is my... Disclosure. So the learning objectives today are to predict, uh, sorry, predictors of live birth or recurrent cycle cancellation in a cycle following an IVF cycle cancellation. So I'll describe all of that in a minute. Um, also to identify any modifiable factors which improve outcomes following IVF cycle cancellation and um, any lab KPIs which are associated with improved outcomes, again, following a cancellation. Is there any way to get the notes? I feel like I'm going to under, okay, perfect, thank you. I'll just fake it till I make it here, okay. Oh, maybe I have notes here, <laughs> terrific. Let me see if I can do this. So this is a very simple schematic um, of how the process starts, and it starts, of course, with a physician consultation. Uh, they do testing for day three, uh, FSH, E2, they do antral follicle count, AMH. They work with the patient to develop the gonadotropin protocol and the dosing. And next, the injectables are given for controlled ovarian hyperstimulation for about an average of 11 days, followed by an ovulation trigger and egg retrieval. About 36 hours um, later, under ultrasound guidance, eggs are retrieved, fertilized, embryos are transferred back into the patient during a fresh transfer, or actually very commonly are frozen for later transfer or biopsied and frozen for later transfer. So despite continued advancements in ART and the more or less personalized nature of each cycle, IVF cycles unfortunately do not always go as planned. Um, in fact, about 10% of cycles per year are canceled during the stimulation process before even reaching the egg retrieval stage. Uh, by far, the most common reason for this is poor response to stimulation, but may also occur for over-response, <clears throat> inadequate endometrial response, 
uh, something like a concurrent illness or withdrawal for per personal or financial reasons. Oh, thank you, Nabil. I actually do see comments here, so um, yeah, I think it's okay. I think I can fake it. Okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> That's very kind, thank you. So when cycle cancellation occurs, patients must be counseled about their adjusted, predicted chance of a live birth if they were to repeat a cycle. So in these scenarios, REIs often look to alternative stimulation protocols as a more desired response, um, to achieve a more desired response. And this is really one of the only variables that we are able to modify from cycle to cycle. However, data supporting this is limited in that existing studies um, that either evaluate a second stimulation after a completed cycle, so it wasn't canceled, <clears throat> one that made it all the way to a transfer, or they don't look at the outcome of live birth. So I'd like to present some original research that we have done on this topic. My fellow Jenna Khan, she completed this study actually as her thesis project, and she's graduating in another month. Um, and we've submitted this paper for peer review to fertility and sterility. And we just got comments back this morning. Um, so we are using SART data. This is a self-reported national IVF registry, um, SART cores, which everyone in this room knows about. Um, and what we did was we sought to understand which patients are most likely to have a live birth from a second cycle after a cancellation um, and to determine any possible predictive variables for cycle success. We also wanted to determine which patients were at risk for recurrent cycle cancellation. And finally, we wanted to determine if changing the STEM protocol in the next IVF cycle affected odds of live birth or recurrent cycle cancellation. So this was a retrospective cohort study of first IVF cycles from SART member clinics between 2014 and 2017 um, that resulted in a cancellation and was followed by a second IVF cycle within the same study period. So as you know, the SART Cores database, um, it represents about 81% of all clinics and 95% of all cycles in the US. And each cycle number, uh, sorry, each cycle is given a SART number at the initiation of the cycle, uh, regardless of the outcome. And since 2014, we were able to link cycles, as you know, from their index cycle of stimulation all the way through to all their subsequent cycles, including FETs, to give you a cumulative live birth rate. And this is why we did this from 2014 to 2017. So data are collected through uh, voluntary submission. It's verified by SART and reported to the CDC. And this is all in compliance <clears throat> with a federal mandate, the Fertility Clinic Success Rate and um, Certification Act. This is from 1992. Uh, the, va the database is validated annually. It's a very rigorous process that SART uh, leadership undergoes for the data. They do quality assurance and validation. I can talk about that in more detail after this talk. Um, and generally, it's found that the data has a discrepancy rate of less than or equal to 5%. So in our study, we define cycle cancellation as cycles which were stopped during stimulation before the egg retrieval. These are the inclusion criteria. And additional exclusion criteria were any supernumerary cycles um, that were canceled, meaning if someone did four cycles, but cycle one and three were canceled, only the first and the subsequent cycles were included in the study. We also excluded any fertility preservation cycles. Uh, these are some of the demographic variables that we controlled for, maternal age, obviously BMI, race, um, which is not a very well-populated field, I'll admit, but uh, the fellow had an interest in this specifically. Smoking status, also not well populated. Gravidity, parity, and infertility diagnosis. These were all collected from the index IVF cycle. Cycle characteristics assessed were the day of cancellation, baseline FSH and AMH, and also the reason for the cycle cancellation of the index cycle. So a total of 13,340 index cycles were included and analyzed for both the demographic and the clinical predictors of their linked second IVF cycle outcome. So these were the univariate analysis variables. There were 3,112 3, patients who had recurrent cycle cancellation and 10,228 egg retrievals. So most of them 
made it to retrieval after cancellation, um, half of which made it to embryo transfer, and there were 1,860 live births. So this figure shows the unadjusted probabilities of live birth and or recurrent cycle cancellation based on maternal age. So the x-axis is um, I don't want to turn away. The x-axis is uh, the SART age groups, and the y-axis is the percent of probability. So we know that maternal age is strongly associated with IVF outcomes. So this is just to show you that as the age of the patient increases, the chance of recurrent cancellation increases, and that's in blue. And um, the ch chances of live birth decreases, and that's in yellow. So you can see that women 43 years older and 43 years old and older have about a 40% chance of having their cycle canceled for a second time. And this is largely due to poor response to the stimulation. Interestingly, this entire population, the live birth we're seeing here, even in the younger patients, is about half of the age-predicted live birth rate as reported by IVF success calculators from both SART and CDC. So this whole population is considered you know, a diminished ovarian reserve population, not surprisingly. OK, I'll take you through this figure. So this figure shows the result of our multivariate logistic regression for odds of recurrent cancellation. The pink dots, yeah, you can see them at the top, represent statistically significant results with uh, p-value of less than 0.05. Confounders that we adjusted for are listed on the right. So the odds of recurrent cycle cancellation increased, okay, so patients who went through and then got canceled again were of higher maternal age, higher BMI, actually in the category known as obesity, a diagnosis of DOR with the um, clinical metrics that you would expect, a high FSH and a low AMH, less than or equal to 1.0 um, nanograms per ml, and the index cycle cancellation was due to poor ovarian stimulation. Those with PCOS or unexplained infertility and an index cycle cancellation or withdrawal from treatment due to concurrent Ill illness had less chance of cancellation. Now these are the odds of live birth. So this shows the multivariate lo logistic regression for odds of live birth. Again, the pink dots represent statistically significant results, and confounders we adjusted for are listed on the right. So again, live birth is associated, interesting, with a diagnosis of male factor, and an index cycle cancellation indication of withdrawal from treatment for any other reason besides DOR. Odds of live birth, however, decreased in the second cycle if the maternal age was greater than or equal to 35, associated with smoking, Asian race, black race, diagnosis of DOR, and again, a high FSH and a low AMH. So we did a sub-analysis to look at whether changing the protocol in the second cycle would impact their outcomes. But before I go into that, I just want to provide a little bit of a background on the three protocols that SART collects data for. So um, there's three of them. Let me go through this here. This is why I wanted my notes. So the agonist flare protocol um, utilizes an initial flare of the effect of the agonist to increase endogenous FSH, um, which is bolstered by the addition of exogenous gonadotropin. And the agonist also blocks an endogenous LH surge by prolonged saturation of the receptor. The suppression protocol starts in the luteal phase prior with uh, the agonist to avoid the initial flare in the follicular phase, and this ultimately results in ovarian suppression, allowing complete control of follicular growth uh, from exogenous gonadotropins, and it also blocks the endogenous LH surge by prolonged saturation of the receptor. And the last protocol, which is the most popular and most, I would say, used these days, is the antagonist protocol. Um, it is using only exogenous gonadotropins to stimulate the ovaries, and once the follicular growth begins, the antagonist is added to prevent the LH surge until you are ready to trigger for ovulation. So again, these were the three protocols that were used, agonist flare, agonist suppression, and agonist. And um, we were measuring this in the first cycle, and in the second cycle, exclusive use of these protocols. We use the same inclusion-exclusion criteria as the initial analysis and additionally excluded any cycles that had more than one STEM protocol listed because that's not really possible. That must have been a self-reported error with the data. 
Um, and after applying this new exclusion criteria, there were 13,135 patients in our population. So patients who received the same protocol compared to those who changed. So here we go. So we use regression models to estimate the association of changes with the odds of recurrent of cancellation or live birth. And again, we adjust it for age, race, BMI, smoking status, AMH, infertility diagnosis. All the cycles were included for the outcome of recurrent cancellation, and we did a sub-analysis of just fresh cycles, about 12,000 of them for live birth. And secondary outcomes were lab KPIs, number of eggs retrieved, and number of 2PNs. So there were 6,434 patients in the same protocol group and 6,701 patients in the change protocol group. The demographic characteristics uh, were similar between two groups. 78% of all patients who had their first cycle canceled for poor response went through for the second cycle. So the mean AMH in the same protocol group was 1.49 compared to 0.98 in the change protocol group, and they both had increases in gonadotropin on the second cycle. This was definitely a confounder, so we did the analysis with and without that. There was no difference in the outcome. There's about 400 extra IUs that was given in the change protocol, in the second, sorry, uh, stimulation protocol. This was significantly different. So after adjusting for confounders, we found that changing the protocol in the second cycle was associated with 0.36 less eggs retrieved and 0.29, oh, I'm so sorry, 0.29 fewer 2PNs created in the second cycle, which is statistically significant but not clinically significant. However, changing the protocol did show a 14% decrease in odds of recurrent cycle cancellation. So there's value in changing the protocol and a 17% increase in odds of live birth increase, both of which were statistically significant. And this is a sub-analysis of the fresh cycles that were canceled for poor response. And again, um, a change in protocol associated with a 20% decrease in cancellation and an 18% increase in odds of live birth. So which change matters? And this is the last part of my talk. We done stratified the data by the index protocol type to further understand the drivers of our results. So this table, and I know it's it's complicated, but I'll go through it. This table depicts a regression model stratified by the type of protocol change, estimating the association of specific change protocols with odds of cancellation or odds of live birth, as well as number of eggs retrieved and the two PNs. So, oh no, I'm not getting the animations. Oh dear. Okay, so let me try it here. So this is the agonist flare. Here we go. So compared with those who stayed on an Agus flare protocol, those who switched to a suppression had on average 3.25 more eggs retrieved and a 67% decreased odds of cycle cancellation. And this is the specific change that's driving the overall decrease in recurrent cancellation with a protocol change seen in the previous model. So changing to an antagonist protocol did not statistically improve or worsen the outcome, so it's switching away from the flare was the key. And conversely, compared to those who use an agonist or an antagonist in their first cycle, switching to an agonist was much worse. Basically, the, the flare was the problem. Um, and I, I don't want to go through all of these. It's a lot of the same data, which is you know, complicated. But the point is that changing the protocol is, has value. Changing away from the flare has value. And so to summarize, in patients with an agonist suppression or an antagonist cycle cancellation, changing their stim to the second protocol that alternates it results in a higher chance of uh, live birth um, independent of egg yield. Changing away from the flare increases your egg yield and decreases odds of cancellation, um, but doesn't affect the law of, uh, odds of uh, live birth. So the strengths of this study include that it's a large population from the national data, um, it's very diverse, it speaks to the generalizability of the findings. Um, to our knowledge though, oh, so this is the largest study that we know addressing the change in protocol and the outcomes of live birth or cancellation. And um, we actually did the sub-analysis of fresh cycles only to look at the impact on live birth. Um, we've avoided the confounding um, 
impact of FETs because of that. We just looked at you know, fresh cycles for live birth outcomes. The limitations, obviously, it's a retrospective study. This is always a limitation with SART data. The variables with significant amount of data that were missing, that included things like uh, race. Age is great, outcomes are great, BMI is pretty good, but race, smoking, these things are of limited value, so I would say that limits the generalizability of those findings. Um, also, any other protocols besides FLARE, agonist, and antagonist, they're not tracked by SART. So in conclusion, age, race, and markers of DOR are characteristics uh, that predict recurrent poor cycle outcomes in IVF cycles, and this is consistent with um, existing IVF literature. Just repeating the second cycle improves outcomes. We saw that 75% of the patients uh, were not canceled for a second cycle. And overall, there seems to be some benefit in changing the protocol after a cancellation. Um, but future studies are needed to assess whether more contemporary protocols, specifically patients with a prior cancellation indication, are needed. And I'd like to acknowledge SART and all the work they do to compile this data and really you know, allows us to try and understand how we practice and how it impacts our patients and the way uh, on a population level. And without the efforts of SART, uh, this research would not have been possible. And these are our references. Thank you. Good afternoon. So I'm the, uh, the second co-moderator, but in contrast to Dr. Swain, I did not memorize the uh, <laughs> the script. It is my pleasure at this time to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Jurgen Lieberman, and uh, who will be talking about a more rapid approach to vitrification, which I'm fascinated by because vitrification already sounds like it's pretty fast. So uh, certified as a high complexity clinical laboratory director through the American Board of Bioanalysts, Dr. Lieberman has been working in the field since 1995. He's director of laboratory services at the Chicago-based fertility centers of Illinois, including embryology, endocrine, the endocrinology, and andrology. Uh, he received his doctoral degree from the Technische Universität von Munich in Bavaria, Germany in 1995. <laughs> and his postdoctoral <laughs> thesis in 2004 qualified him as university lecturer in experimental reproductive medicine at the Bavaria University in Würzburg. And in 2017, Dr. Lieberman took uh, the position of the scientific uh, co-chair at the Council of Physicians and Scientists, the nation's largest private network of physicians and embryologists. Dr. Lieberman has been frequently invited to present at national and international meetings, has authored numerous papers and abstracts, and contributed more than 15 book chapters in the area of reproductive sciences. And now we get a plug for his book because in 2007, he co-authored a book with Dr. Michael Tucker, Tuckered Vitrification in Human Assisted Reproduction. Due to the high demand for this technique, a second edition was published in 2016. Dr. Lieberman. Thank you very much, I know it's a mouthful. Um, thank you very much for inviting me and organizing that meeting. Uh, I'm very impressed and amazed. You know, it's, it's not easy to set something up, uh, especially to have a successful meeting. It takes some time, some effort, a lot of people involved we don't see, they are all in the back, so big thank you to everyone uh, we might don't see and hear. Uh, yeah, I wanna talk about vitrification and uh, you know, we talked about simulation protocols and we talked about automatic ICSI, but we never talked about what's actually coming out of all this, X embryos and something we have to freeze. Because most of that stuff we generate in a culture dish, uh, we cannot transfer at the same time. So we have to have something in, in the backyard to uh, preserve these embryos, oocytes or sperm, for a potential later use without compromising their potential to implant and to generate babies. So, uh, and you know, my talk today is about vitrification. Vitrification is, that's my disclosure. 
uh, vitrification is out there since uh, 1985. Uh, it was coming in the field. Of course, most of the stuff we do was coming uh, over the vit veterinarian science field. And so it was Garbo Weider who introduced in 96 open pool straws, vitrifying bovine and pigs embryos. And then it moved slowly to us. We adapted it. And I think we made it more successful than ever the slow freezing protocols were before for many 20 years about. But you know, nothing really changed in terms of cryopreservation. Uh, what are the aims? You know, we have to create an intracellular environment that supports the transition from a liquid to a solid glass-like stage. We uh, have to make sure the intracellular compartments must be conditioned to allow the emergency and maintenance of a vitreous state. The arrest of the metabolomics, which could be then reversed, maintain structural and genetic integrity, uh, achieve acceptable and survival rates of the warming, and of course, whatever protocol you use and implement, it has to be reliable and repeatable. I apologize that some uh, you know, letters here shifted. That's why I always have my own laptop. This time, I don't. Um, and you know, what's the steps usually from uh, you know, the culture dish into the nitro chain? It's uh, initial exposure to cryoprotectants because every uh, small uh, oocyte or embryo has the same percentage of water as your body has, about 70%. So we have to get rid of that water. We have to dehydrate the cell to freeze it successful at a very low temperature. That's the temperature of liquid nitro chain. Uh, we store it uh, when we have to do the opposite. We have to rehydrate, we warm and fall with oocytes and embryos by removing the cryoprotectant, bring the water back, and then they are ready for a transfer back in uh, a physiological environment where they usually belong. Um, so maybe some of you might remember this time. This is, uh, this is not uh, an embryo uh, culture device, you know, it's not an incubator. Most of you maybe think so. It's not. This is uh, a, a bunch of slow freezers back in the 90s. And I show them because they were very noisy. Uh, Rusty Pool maybe remembers that. They made a lot of noise. It was always a dance to get all the embryos from all the patients loaded at once. It took about 10 to 15 minutes when the machine went to seating temperature about minus six. This took another 10 to 15 minutes after seeding. The machine went and seeding, if you don't know what it is, we initially initiated the growth of ice crystals by touching the straw. Uh, and then after seeding, the machine went about 0.3% Celsius per minute to the temperature of minus 30 to 40, and then we plunged it to minus 90, 196. That took about 2.5 hours. Uh, I have here a protocol that I implemented uh, 20 years ago for zygotes. Um, Germany is, uh, was a big zygote freezer because we couldn't freeze embryos uh, because of an embryo protection law. And you see it took us 98 minutes to get the embryos from a culture dish to the place uh, where they belong when we want to freeze them. And so opposite side, would, what would be the alternative? Uh, liquid nitrogen bath. And I took that picture in 2000 where, you know, I mean, most of us didn't even know what behind, what's behind the word vitrification. And, you know, I did a simple demonstration by having a dish sitting in liquid nitrogen. And before I created two drops, one is uh, uh, pure saline, DPS, and on the right side was a solution at that time of a combination of ethylene glycol and DMSO, 20%, and 0.4 molar sucrose. And uh, what you see is, you know, I can guarantee you both drops are at an amorph state. It's solid uh, state, but the left one was created by ice crystals, obviously by the white color you see. And the right is also amorph and solid, but there is no ice crystals. That's a benefit that we can prevent, if we do it right, intracellular ice crystal formation in the eggs and embryos we freeze. Uh, and so I, I mentioned that in 85, 9, 2012, we got a lot of reports, more and more successful. But then, you know, since today, there was not much change in our protocols. 
we increased the volume of the drops, we moved away from merging the drops to protocols where we went with a time to make it more reliable and consistent between embryologists, but that was not really a dramatic change. We still use the same solutions. You might use slightly some different, but the basics are the same. You have a modified media that contains 20% uh, serum subsidy, the protein. You have a solution where you first expose the cells. We call it an equilibration solution. It contains 7.5% uh, ethylene glycol DMSO. If you go with a vitro life medium, it will be 8% ethylene glycol umpropanediol. And the vitrification solution is the final step where we actually expose cells very short, not more than 60 seconds. It's 15% uh, in case of vitrification solution from vitro life, it would be 16%. And these solutions contain 0.5 or 0.65 molar sucrose. Um, that didn't change. And uh, uh, what needs to happen before vitrification? As I mentioned, we have to dehydrate. We have to remove the intracellular water. We can do that with uh, cryoprotectant. They move in. It's a very simple uh, osmosis. Uh, and uh, water gets pushed out. What happens because of the water loss, the cell will uh, reduce its volume, it will shrink, and when you incubate it long enough, it will come back actually too close to its original volume, about 80, 90%. And you know, if you look at that time at the cells, you don't really believe they were dehydrated, but they are. And that's the simple things we have to consider, the hypertonic, isotonic, or the hypotonic um, uh, steps it depends, you know, what you do. In that case, we want to freeze. In that case, you know, we want to do the opposite. We want to reverse and warm them up. And uh, just to give you a little bit of a slide, when we vitrified blastocysts before, as I mentioned, you know, we started with a drop uh, to rinse them. When we merged after three minutes, and we kept them here in a single drop of uh, ES in five minutes. And then we went through uh, four drops of VS in 60 seconds. It took us nine minutes. Uh, that didn't dramatically change. I just shortened it now to seven minutes, uh, but much more simpler. We have uh, one drop of uh, uh, rinse media. It's actually ES. And then we expose it here in ES for six minutes. And then we freeze here in two drops of VS going through in one minute, so a total of uh, seven minutes. Uh, when we warm the cells, we have to do the opposite. As I mentioned, we now have to get rid of the uh, cryoprotectant that's sitting in the cell. And if you expose them to your warming solution, uh, you know, water has a desire to uh, create an equilibrium. And based on osmotic, it's rushing in the cell uh, with the purpose, you know, to make an equilibrium inside, outside. And in return, the cryoprotectant gets pushed out. The key is that you have to control this water influx uh, if you don't do, you know, you will have no survival. And uh, cells will gain their volume over time, and then they look also very normal when you get them ready for transfer. Uh, then for the warming, you know, our dish was even more complicated. It took us 11 minutes. We uh, fought them, most of you, uh, in 37 degrees Celsius in uh, one molar. Uh, TS, and then we went in one molar, connecting 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 with no uh, sucrose, uh, diluting the sucrose out, and on the end we kept them in a uh, wash solution with no sucrose. It took us 11 minutes, and uh, you know the key here really is that we improve that protocol by plunging in uh, now a bigger drop of 400 microliter of uh, one molar sucrose at 37 degrees and then we move from there after this immediately in our culture dish, which is ready for transfer. We use for the transfer sage blast media, uh, remnants of the single, of the, um, um, of the uh, step media, no uh, first step for day three sequential media. Uh, and uh, so the blast medium was the last step in the sequential media. We still keep it for transfer of frozen embryos and adding 20% protein. And I want to mention it's very important that this publication was done before. It was a prize abstract at PCRS, and it was also a prize paper at ASRM by a group out of uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tyler, Mann, 
and uh, they tried to publish it, uh, but I think it ended nowhere. And so we started to look into this. Uh, we did in-house studies. We had uh, a lot of embryos uh, signed for this position. So I started to, uh, before I implemented this, about 600 embryos, 564 blastocysts, mostly PGD abnormal embryos. And uh, I differentiated in embryos that were biopsied and some that were not biopsied. They all had an excellent survival. They looked awesome after 24 hours. That's what we used as a survival criteria. Uh, and their ability to uh, hatch and totally to hatch out, it was amazing. And, uh, but we also saw that it was necessary to some extent when you look at the number of hatched embryos, biopsied and uh, non-biopsied, here is biopsied, non-biopsied. There is a significant number of embryos where they didn't uh, underwent BGD. I think they require still assisting hatching to make sure that this percentage has, is able to come out of the sonar and to implant. So after these results were very, very encouraging and uh, we started then uh, after presenting to the physicians uh, this in September last year. Uh, I report here close to 1,000 transfers. We now have uh, 1,020. Uh, and you see here our distribution, the 38% were uh, FETs with no tested embryos where were not, uh, uh, bio, uh, were not tested with biopsy. And the majority, 61%, were embryos where we knew they were euploid. Um, I followed up with about 833 uh, FETs in terms of ongoing pregnancy and implantation. Um, this is our study population, 833, ongoing pregnancy and implantation, average age 36.2. We transferred in average 1.6 embryos. 1.06, I'm sorry. Uh, this is just a positive beta. Uh, but I, I personally believe in the importance of a positive beta. It depends where you set your positive beta. Uh, but you see here, uh, close to 1,000, we get a positive beta of 78%, 79 in 35 to 37, and 75 in 38 to 40, and overall here, over 40, 67.5. So you will argue, I'm sure you have more PGD transfers. That's true, but if I show you more slides, uh, you will see not a significant difference. Anyway, if we look at uh, untested and tested embryos, surprisingly, it is not what you might expect. I'm sorry, yeah, it doesn't work. But you see here 72% uh, positive beta and 74 for embryos tested. That was not significant. I'm sorry, but that stuff shifted here. Um, when we look at embryos now, with the whole nine yard of assessment and really true numbers from positive beta to clinical pregnancy, ongoing and implantation. We have uh, here uh, close to 69% implantation with an uh, ongoing pregnancy of close to 66% uh, for patients under 35, 61 for 35 to 37, close to 60 for 38 to 40, and a little bit of drop, but still 53% ongoing for patients over 40. It brings us to an average of 60.4% ongoing pregnancy with an implantation of close to 64%. Uh, when we look at untested and tested, uh, you see here for untested embryos, we have 58% ongoing pregnancy. And you see here a benefit of PGD, what you also will see when you look at the age, there is no question. Uh, we gained about 5%, 6% for uh, transferring tested embryos. It is not significant because of the uh, size. We need more ends. Implantation rate here 60% versus 66.3%. 60, uh, that was significant. I have five minutes left, I might need 10. Uh, slow freezing, and I wanna show you the difference, uh, you know, when we compared our uh, technique where we used 11% of warming to one minute, it's a different size number, uh, but you know, we will get close where I took uh, 
uh, transfer from 22 and 23. So we didn't change anything. It's in a very short time. So only thing changed that we went from 11 to one minute. And you see here survival is no difference. We didn't have to thaw more embryos to get to the same outcome with rapid thawing because some people think we put a lot of stress on these embryos. It is equivalent. There is also no additional stress factor or field that might can act as a bias for the rapid warming. If we look now, uh, comparing traditional warming to rapid warming, just to make it briefly, because of the time, uh, we have ongoing pregnancy 55 versus 60, and implantation rate of 56 versus 63. So we gain overall uh, a certain percentage in favor of the rapid warming. Uh, our miscarriage rate, miscarriage rate is even lower when we go with a rapid warming. So can we lower than one molar sucrose for warming? Uh, I did, and it works. You can go to 0.5 or even 0.25. I cannot believe I have only 20 minutes already passed. <laughs> you have a different clock. And uh, so 0.25 molar and one molar, there is no difference, right? This is a study from Belgium that was presented at a meeting. So only difference if you have a lower concentration of sucrose, the time to re-expansion is significant shorter when you form them in one molar. Even time to hatching is also significant uh, uh, lower. So they hatch significantly faster, need less time when you form them in one molar. And that's our numbers. Uh, you know, we also showed when 0.5 or even 0.25 molar is uh, equivalent to one molar, and it looks like even the lower concentration of 0.25 molar is beneficial for faster recovery and therefore significant higher hatching rate. Uh, so to uh, show you some embryos, uh, embryos blastocysts, one minute, four in 0.5 molar, they're all uh, for disposition. It's right off the warming, quite fast expansion. Overall, you see there is barely one who didn't survive. <clears throat> and you see already here, 24 hours later, uh, most of them are totally hatched out. And I think the last slide is also here for a totally hatched out. And when we have some embryos, we didn't biopsy, and you see a difference in the last slide. Here we go. You see here a lot of embryos were still sitting in the sauna, and they were not biopsied. So I would still encourage to do assisting hatching on these embryos. Um, so uh, first uh, try it also for 0.25 molar, just some slides. It's also 0.25 molar. They all look fine, or well, some of them just didn't survive. But you see also, you know, post warming, 24 hours. Okay, so to summarize to that point, uh, this rapid warming simplifies laboratory technique for warming blastocysts. It reduces unnecessary time blastocysts are exposed to room temperature and in turn reduces stress to the blastocyst. David Gardner showed that adding antioxidants to the wheat warming solution is increasing the cell number in blastocysts. Time saving and smoother workflow, which reduces the pressure stress of embryologists, especially in big programs with 10 or more FETs per day. Before, we always put like two embryologists on four in case of 10 FETs. Now they are all done by one. Future will be vitifying blastocysts in two minutes at room temperature, uh, 37 or 37 degrees, I prefer room temperature, and warming will happen at 37 in one minute in 0.5 or 0.25 molar. Target is combining rapid vitification with rapid warming. Having a kit available with one vial ES, one vial VS, and one vial TS is cost saving and streamlines ordering. Rapid vitification, I didn't talk about this today, but rapid warming is easy to implement in your daily routine and standardized blastocysts cryopreservation and its outcome even more successful. And uh, a little bit on the end, also here you see the time saving. You know, when we talk about 11 minutes uh, and you add that up for a day, you need like 
close to two hours to four of them, and when we talk one minute, you know, you can four of them the same number in about 10 minutes. Including paperwork, it takes a little bit longer, but it's a huge time-saving factor. Um, and I you know I was also in Norway. Uh, it was my first trip at the beginning of this year. Uh, don't ask me why I went in January, but it was not sunny, it was cold. But people were very warm, and I got a lot of response, and uh, that makes me very happy when I see this response, how people start to implement and are successful. Uh, and I want to talk briefly, now time is over, but I still have one slide or two slides for you that you might be interested. We talk about egg freezing. Uh, is it safe, reliable, repeatable, and successful? Is it entirely true? You have more and more babies born from vitified eggs, there is no question. But you know, most of you, I'm sure, have the same tendency. You know, we vitify every day more and more besides biopsy. So this number gets increasing day by day. And it's very important, you know, that we really have a reliable uh, protocol to make sure we preserve these gametes for later use successfully. And uh, again, what happens during vitification, I mentioned that briefly. You know, we fall, we uh, shrink them, and then we wait for re-expansion, and that's why the protocol takes so long. But you know, this is actually not the right thing. But also for someone who does not lab work, I want to show you when eggs get dehydrated, uh, like in three minutes. Next slide would be in six minutes. You see what I'm talking about, where we regain their volume. It would be after six minutes. If you go to the next 10 minutes, you would barely recognize where we were dehydrated, like here, right? But then when we go in the final concentration in VS, that's twice the concentration of the ES, you see a traumatic shrink again, like here, right? And so there was some uh, very smart people, they actually figured out that the oocyte osmotic behavior indicates that the dehydration upon exposure to standard cryoprotectant occurs very fast. The point of minimum volume of the shrink well curve is reached in second in 60 seconds, right? At this point, intracellular water ejection is complete, which coupled with the penetration of low molecular weight CPA results in similar intra and extracellular solute concentration. That means that prolonging exposure to the cryoprotectant solution does not improve the cytosolic class formation tendency and could be avoided. After two minutes of exposure to standard cryoprotectant solution, the critical intracellular solute concentration necessary for successful vitrification was attained. And to confirm it with some uh, graphs from their uh, publication, you see here A is uh, one minute freezing and B would be uh, usually 10 to 11 minutes. And what you see here, you know, after one minute you get that shrinkage of the volume, a slight recovery, and then you drop it again after one minute in DS and you get another shrinkage, about 40% of volume. And in the opposite, when your cell is shrinking, the concentration of intercellular solute goes up. And if you look at that curve, you know, that's one minute, you get pretty much to the same volume like you get here. And now, you know, it regains volume, it regains to 80%, and then you shrink it again to about 40 uh, to 50, like here. So, you know, here this long time in uh, the ES has no benefit at all. And so what I did, and you see here again, there is uh, here uh, uh, 10 seconds and uh, you know, one, 60 seconds here. And then you, uh, this is now opposite. The EP here is the 10 minutes shrinkage, recovery, and then you shrink them again, right? And we wonder why we let them recover and shrink them again. Well, there must be some stress on the oocyte we might can prevent. And when you look at the uh, one minute here, DP, there is your one minute here, and then in VS, and we shrink them again. We just don't wait for this, right? Recovery. And I get to my end. Uh, so as I mentioned, what is different from the rapid vitrification, we don't wait for this. We don't wait for that the cells recover their volume. We freeze them because in that short time, of one minute ES, one minute VS, they have no way to recover. So, and uh, you know, I did a bunch of studies since last year in May 22, I started vitifying eggs. And uh, you know, I can tell you that the future will be, without going into detail, 
I freeze all these eggs you see here, polar body well preserved. Uh, you will see German vesicles, uh, they are well preserved, polar body here again. Uh, that uh, I can successfully vitify eggs in two minutes and four of them in two minutes. So it takes me a total of three minutes. You see also abnormal fertilized after warming. You see a German vesicle uh, looks totally fine and normal without being uh, compromised during the crisis especially during this very short time of a total of freezing and thawing of four minutes. Uh, future of cryopreservation for will be combining rapid vitrification with rapid warming. I mentioned that before. But on the end, you know, I'm always uh, full of joy when I get something like this from a patient back because that's all about not so much my talk here, but how we do uh, our homework and how we do our best to make the best out of these embryos to make it possible that patients get pregnant. And uh, this is a little bit uh, a contribute from a patient that made me very exciting and of course my team included. So I thank you very much. If you have questions, raise my email, shoot me emails. I usually answer them very, uh, very fast and uh, quite fast. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thanks, Jurgen. Uh, so the next speaker really needs no introduction, um, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, Dr. Denny Sakis uh, has been involved for several decades since the early 80s in assisted reproduction. Uh, got his PhD down at Monash with Alan Trounson. Um, is currently the chief scientific officer of Boston IVF, and really, you name it, he's done it when it comes to uh, research dealing with gametes and embryos, sperm, eggs, uh, embryos. <clears throat> Culture media, um, you know, new technologies, worked with a variety of companies and helped uh, develop a lot of the things that we do today. And so he's going to be talking a little bit about some of that, just a small portion of some of his work, um, specifically sequential versus single step media formulations and embryo meta uh, metabolomics. <clears throat> Dr. Sakis, thanks. So thank you. Um, so it's a quite complicated uh, lecture title, but I'll try to do my best to explain everything about culture media. Uh, first, I'd really like to thank uh, Sheila and Nabil for the invitation and, and all the people behind the scenes that, uh, that do this invitation. So a little bit about the first five days of everyone here's life, basically. What happens? So a lot happens that we sort of, we visualise down the microscope. We have these amazing videos that my my medical director, Michael Alper, calls pornography for embryologists whenever he sees videos, and I love that. I want to publish a paper saying that, but I might not actually do it. So, but a lot actually happens here. So, you know, one of the first things we know is there's a transition from this reliance on the mother with purely maternal messenger RNA to embryonic transcription. And this happens in nearly all mammalian embryos. And in the, in the human, and it's been shown to happen between the four to eight cell stage. So this, this amazing video of development in the first five days, you know, we see these images and we see these lovely embryos developing, but behind the scenes, the embryo is doing these incredibly complicated things, and I'm going to go through some of those complicated things. You have to remember that all these complicated things have to be supported by what we grow them in. So, this is just a quick summary of some of the complicated things they do. And what we've learned many, many years ago, and Rusty gave a, a great presentation earlier about some of the pioneers that worked on this, is the embryo is a little bit schizophrenic in the way it uses its metabolism. And one of the things that it does, you know, we, we've actually shown that sperm actually like to have a little bit of glucose around, but then the early embryo actually changes the way it metabolizes. And this was fundamental in the way we created culture media many, many, many years ago. So one of the first thing it does is it actually relies mostly on pyruvate and lactate in the early stages. And then it has this switch where it goes to using glucose or glycolysis as its main energy source. And this is, I just show this because David Gardner always shows this just to confuse everybody. Uh, and he could probably name all the molecules in this, but I, I can't. Uh, so in the early stage, it's undergoing, in the cleavage stage, it's undergoing the tribocarboxylic cycle. It's using pyruvate and lactate as its main energy source. And then it switches completely and basically for the rest of its life to, to glucose-based metabolism. 
It's very interesting because the, the actual other cells that do this are metastatic cancers. So cancer cells do this also, and they have this switch, and the difference, obviously, is a cancer is uncontrollable, sadly, but the embryo has this ability to control this switch in metabolism. So it's a, it's a peripheral area of research that a lot of people interested in this, uh, in this, in this area show. So this is the classic um, graph that was shown many years ago. I thought this was going to work, but you can see here, up to the eight cell stage, you have this reliance on, on pyruvate as a metabolic source. It, it decreases, and then you get this increase in glucose metabolism. And, that, and this is seen in nearly all mammalian embryos. And it's a phenomenon that's really intrigued us how it's controlled in that. But as I said, it's fundamental to the embryo culture media we use. And it even gets more complicated than that, because the body knows that this is what it needs to do. So in the fallopian tube, if you look at the fallopian tube, you can see the embryo goes these dramatic changes in the energy sources, but the actual fallopian tube, it knows it, it, it actually has to do these types of things. So it actually has this gradient within it from fallopian tube to the uterus. There's an oxygen gradient, and the embryo is actually being prepared to actually undergo implantation. And you can see this decrease in it is decreasing reliance to the Krebs cycle, this reliance on glucose, and this decrease in oxygen concentrations that it sees actually as it develops. So why am I talking about all this? So one of the reasons is that we, for many years, didn't quite understand this, and we, we actually started understanding this in the early 90s, and we changed the way we grow our embryos. So a lot of the embryos that we grow now are reliant on these changes. And I'm going to talk about the old days and the newer days and, and hopefully what, how we're going to culture embryos in the future. So these are the types of embryo culture media we, we're familiar with. Of course, we had the first media, which were actually amazingly based on just Krebs ringers bicarbonate, of like basically six or seven salts that we threw pyruvate, lactate and glucose into and got births. So all the first, a lot of the first pregnancies were actually in this very simple media. And it, I think Rusty mentioned it before, it just shows we're actually incredibly lucky in IVF, in human IVF in particular, that the embryo has a lot of plasticity in actually trying to get to its ultimate aim of, of becoming a live birth. So people also looked at complex tissue culture media, and I was glad Rusty showed a photo of, of his Menizo there, who had the first Menizo's B2 media that was used a lot in Europe. And then we went to this sequential media, which makes a lot of sense, because you're, you're catering for this shift that the embryo undergoes. So you're going from the cleavage stage to the blastocyst stage. But then we had the one-step media, which sort of was like a one-thing-fits-all type thing. So it had a mix of, of pyruvate, lactate, and glucose, but as I said before, the embryo is so plastic that it actually it does really well in it. So what's the basis for the, for the sequential culture media? So grosso modo, basically cleavage culture media, pronuclear to eight cell stage, there's very low glucose or no glucose at all in some, high pyruvate and lactate, EDTA, which is like a complete lecture and has to do with a thing that many of us suffered for many years with mice with, uh, called the two cell block. And then, and then we found that there's actually a particular mix of amino acids that needs to be in. And actually, the, the cleavage culture media preferred non-essential non amino acids. Obviously, as the embryo gets more complex, it's undergoing differentiation, it starts developing more of an adult phenotype, if you want. It needs glucose, it needs high, low pyruvate and lactate, because it's not reliant on those as much anymore, and needs the full complement of essential amino acids. So that's, that's sort of the basic levels of, of your sequential culture media. And as I said before, if you actually look at the initial media, basically you can count on nearly one hand, or one and a half hands, how many components were in there? And what, what still fascinates me today is how many babies were born from these culture media, how simple they are, and how it seems that the, the embryo can go into automatic, basically, to survive, even with, its simple, with these simple culture media. And this, if you're, if you're a bit of an embryo media geek, the, a number of papers have been published that actually characterise the type of culture media we use today. And this, this is actually the composition of sequential media. And you can see most of them follow the pattern of low, low glucose and then changing over to higher glucose in, in the cleavage, in the, from the cleavage to the blastocyst media and vice versa 
from, uh, for, for lactate and pyruvate. So they all follow this, this type of uh, pattern, if you want, uh, slightly different levels if you, if you want to look at them, but all have this basic phenomenon of low glucose to high glucose, high pyruvate lactate to lower pyruvate lactate. But then a lot of the single step media came along and as I said before, they cater amazingly well to, to the way our blastocysts develop. In, in many studies, some of the early studies showed that actually blastocysts developed even faster in some of these mediums. And, and a lot of this was thanks to John Biggers and, the, and his foresight in using these simplex methods for developing media. So that's where we are now. We have this basic understanding of embryo metabolism. We, we know we can sort of cheat the system a little bit by using one-step media very efficiently. But there are other things that we, I think in the future we will start looking at. So one-step sequential media, I'm going to talk a little bit of microfluidics in the end. We saw a great talk by, by Rick Polson, who even showed us the, the, the soccer ball before, and he showed us how complex actually the, the uterine environment is. But you have to remember, we're growing these media in, in water, basically. They're not growing in water in the, in the uterus or the fallopian tube. It's a very viscous solution. So we haven't even really attacked that, that type of aspect yet about actually looking at viscosity of media. And there are indications that the viscosity will have actually profound changes on the embryo in terms of actually how it compacts. So, so these are things I think in the future we have to look at. Co-culture was a thing of the past, but maybe we need to revisit it. Gas phases, new incubators, all these are things we will eventually look at. And, and these are sort of the factors that we, we will cover eventually when we're looking at culture media. And I won't go into all of these, but, but there are a lot of things that we really don't have an, a, a really good understanding of. But what we do know is what we thought we knew really well was the metabolism of embryo. It's a slam dunk. We know this happens at the cleavage stage and this happens at the blastocyst stage. But can we learn more about the metabolic signatures of the human blastocyst? Is there more ju than just this metabolic shift? So we've been very interested in that for quite a few years and we've been looking at various discovery platforms and most of these platforms we've, we've aimed to look at to sort of try to predict which embryo is the best one. And I won't go into that because it's a very different talk. But one of the technologies I'm going to talk about is a fluorescence, a semi-non-invasive technology based on looking at the, at, at the metabolism of embryos. So we know that the embryo actually shows differences in, in its developmental capabilities. And actually, in 1980, Jean-Paul Renard and Yves Menizo showed in cow embryos that embryos that had a higher glucose uptake, bovine embryos, led to a higher rate of pregnancy or ongoing pregnancies. And um, this is a, a study done, Henry Lees and colleagues did these studies in mice and other species, but David Gardner and Michelle Lane did this study many years ago now, so it's more than 10 years, which is amazing, showing that actually if you looked at the embryo's metabolism before you transferred it, so these are blastocysts, and it had a high glucose uptake, it was more likely to, read, to lead to a pregnancy than ones that had a low, preg, low glucose uptake. So we know the metabolic signature of a blastocyst at least and its glucose uptake is, is imperative for it to actually be viable or not viable. Problem is, this technique, there's probably only a handful of people in the world that can actually do the technique that measures glucose uptake. So we've always been looking for methodologies that would allow us to look at, at metabolism in another way, that, a faster way. So we've been working now for several years on this technology called fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy. It's a, a laser-based technique and it allows us to metabolically and non-invasively look at the, the signature of embryos and oocytes. So this is just a quick video. This is just showing, this is a, a stylized video showing how we can actually grow embryos under this. And this initial paper, we did a lot of work on mouse embryos. We showed a lot of characteristics of how metabolism works. We repeated a lot of the old studies and validated them. But we also showed that this metabolic uh, technique was actually safe, so we could, we could we could grow embryos under the microscope for five or six days, mouse embryos, transfer them back to, to pseudo-pregnant mice and get fetuses and they all look normal. They weren't fluorescing differently or had a weird activity, but they were all normal. So we were quite um, confident that this technique worked. 
So fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy, it's not just looking at the intensity that you're used to looking at fluorescence images. It's a, it's a, a novel, non-invasive method of embryo imaging that gives us more than just the, the, just the fluorescence intensity, but gives us actually the time and molecule will stay in an excited state. And what we're looking at, the two candidates we're looking at with um, non-invasive metabolic screening is NADH and FAD, which are both key factors in, in mitochondrial uh, function. I won't go into this in, 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 a, in a great lot of detail. We all believe mitochondria hopefully are very important. If you don't, then I think you've got a problem. Uh, <laughs> you could get rid of your mitochondria and you're not gonna do very well. But mitochondria are integral to our energy source. And it's the same for an embryo. One of the cool things, though, is two of the things, the key factors in mitochondrial metabolism, NADH and FAD, they both do this thing called autofluorescence. So when you excite them with a, with a laser, they actually emit fluorescence. And there's quite a lot of uh, factors in the body, in cells, that actually do this. So we can do these non-invasive screenings without actually adding a molecule in there to try to make the embryo fluoresce. So it's, they're autofluorescing when we excite them. So what do we look at? I won't go into this completely, but we look at when an embryo fluoresces, or NADPH or, N, or FAD, and, and how long it takes to actually get down from the excited state. And we can measure these really geeky things about mitochondria. So in total, we look at the brightness, we look at the lifetime a, a, a molecule stays in an excited state, how long it takes to get to a, a, a shorter state or to, to defluoresce, and how, what the lifetime overall is of that fluorescence. So for NADH and FAD, we get, we get four parameters of their, of their existence within the mitochondria, if you want, and we also get a thing called the redox potential, which is the, the F NADH divided by FAD, which is important also in, in knowing how the embryo functions. So we can measure all these parameters, and we get a lot of information about how an embryo develops. You can see here on the left-hand side is NADH, on the right-hand side of FAD, the first thing you see, FAD is not as bright as the NAD. And you can see around the time of eight cell stage, it changes over and it's actually brighter. So this is a really cool way of repeating this experiment that was done 30 years ago. So that's exciting, but uh, it just shows us we can do this non-invasively and actually validates a lot of the work that, that Henry Lees did for many, many years. So that's nice, but we, we actually get much more information. And I'm going to talk now about what we found out about blastocysts, how human blastocysts metabolise in, in not just this simple way that we thought, but actually how clever they are in actually using metabolic uh, factors in, in the culture media. So these are two papers that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to be like uh, Jürgen and say I'm not going to look at the client. <laughs> but these are, these are, this is how we do it. So we take human blastocysts, and we just scan through them. So this is just an indication of just scanning through them. And we take three sections. Basically, we focus on the inner cell mass, above and below the inner cell mass. And this is what we found out. We, we looked at, at many blastocysts. These were all donated, discarded blastocysts. They were from 137 patients. So we could look at, at blastocysts overall. We could look at differences between blastocysts from the same patient. And we could look at variability between like the trophectoderm scans and that that we did. And what did we find out? So the first thing we saw, and we sort of knew before, inner cell mass and trophectoderm actually metabolize in a very, very different way. So we have this big concept that they all use glucose, but they use it in very different ways. And if you look at, if you look at the metabolism, metabolic signature of, of the inner cell mass and trophectoderm, we find that the inner cell mass and trophectoderm are very different in terms of how they metabolize. And you can virtually, if you look at the blue dots, um, unfortunately this isn't working, but if you look at the blue dots, oh, there you go. If you look at the blue dots of the inner cell mass and the orange or yellow are, are trophectoderm, you can virtually draw a line between the, the, the combined inner cell mass and trophectoderm. So they are very different in the way they metabolize. And so they have different metabolic states. What about metabolic states of trophectoderm inside and outside? It's the same thing. If you look at the inside and outside of, of, of trophectoderm, you can see the energy they need to expend is very different from the ones that are outside, the outside of the zona pellucida versus those inside the zona pellucida. We even see different, so we see very different states of the, of the trophectoderm. We also see 
very different states from what we thought was the same embryo. So if you grade all these embryos and say, this is an AA, this is a BB, this is a CC, what's fascinating is that there's no significant difference in the metabolic state of these embryos. So an AA may have exactly the same metabolic signature as a CC embryo, for those of you that understand the, the, the scoring of embryos. So embryo metabolic state and morphology could offer synergistic information for embryo selection. What happens when we grow them? And this is one of the things that really fascinated me. So we see differences in, in the way embryos expand. So we see that they're obviously changing their energy production as they expand. And the thing that always fascinated me is that regardless if it's a, an AA on day five or a BB or an AA on day six, it doesn't matter. There's, a, there's an internal clock in the embryo that tells it it's day five and tells us at day six, regardless of its morphology. So the embryo knows in itself that actually it's going to change from day five to day six. So it's like a clock mechanism that drives metabolism. Oops. For some reason my... OK. Oh. I've gone to a completely different slide here. <laughs> I'm presenting, I think, uh, Jürgen's presentation's come back. <laughs> <laughs> so, this has stopped working. So, and on, on here, I actually, I'm seeing, uh, actually, I'm seeing Sangeeta's presentation. <laughs> right, let me see if I can, no. Do you remember what I'm on here, it's saying 119 of 137, but I'm, I'm seeing Sangeeta's presentation. It's frozen on here, so are you able to control the... And then it says to this laptop, you can see next slide. Okay. So you can see here, like, a day five and day six embryo are very, are very different, regardless of their morphology. Um, the next slides, while I'm, I'll, I can talk to them while they're going, we showed actually that, actually that when you, so here is the metabolic signature. Can I, can I change this or are you changing it? Okay. It's not working. This one. Oh, did it move? Okay. Maybe it's just delayed. So I'll just go. Okay. So there is an association between embryo developmental rate and metabolism. And let me see. I'll just skip through these. This is very random. Oh. So one of the things we're also interested in is the ploidy status. Can you look at metabolic signatures and see if an embryo is euploid or aneuploid? So we actually published this. Uh, it was Jamin Sharatel, and I'm still having problems clicking this. Oh. There you go. It's very slow. Um, so you, we do see a difference. This was, this was like just a few embryos, but actually we've done many more to this date, and we now see about an 81% or 0.8 um, uh, ROC curve analysis, area under the curve analysis, of showing embryos that are euploid or aneuploid in association with their, with, their embryo develop, with their embryo metabolism. The sad thing is, and I'm not showing it here, when we do this and we've done a, random, we've done a, a pilot clinical trial looking for embryo metabolism and seeing if they go to pregnancy or not, we're not able to see a difference in pregnancy related to the metabolism. We can see everything about a blastocyst, but we can't tell you with its, morph with its metabolism if it's going to be pregnant or not. And we've done over 100 transfers. So I won't go through all these techniques. I'll just go right through to the end. I think you can see these. It, so the metabolic signature of the, of the human blastocyst it's much more than, than this switch from, from glucose or from lactate and pyruvate to glucose. So it, it re readily uses high oxygen levels of, of high levels of, of uh, glucose. 
It also has a really high uh, amount of a consumption of oxygen, and it still converts half of that glucose to, to lactate, actually. It's consumed by lactate, and it performs aerobic glycolysis. All right. But it's much smarter than that. It does this, it has a distinct metabolic signature between the inner cell mass and trophectoderm. It has distinct metabolic states outside and inside the trophectoderm. It knows that it's actually not dependent on its actually stage or its morphology. So different morphology embryos have the same actually meta metabolic signature. The, the strange thing is there, there is this switch from day five to day six where the embryo knows it's its, it's, it's a fifth day of development and it knows it's in the sixth day of development. And finally, the metabolic state may be associated with its ploidy status. And, and then it creates its own metabolic environment and signaling mechanism through lactate during implantation. So metabolism is much, much more than what we're doing. And to be honest, we're, we're really, we're relying on the embryo in these, in these culture media that we use. So maybe we can do this better. So the, the lab of the future will be, I think, very different. We'll have new technologies. We've spoken about automation, artificial intelligence. We've spoken about microfluidics. All these things will come together to possibly change the way we culture embryos. And we've already seen automation in the lab. And this is a paper published nearly 15 years ago now by David Gardner and a group at, at, at MIT, where they actually they, they looked at the embryo and they actually cultured it in a specific microfluidic chip and they could measure inside and outside what was going on in the embryo. And Gary Smith has obviously done many, many years of work. He, in the early 2000s, uh, they, looked at, they, they looked at these types of systems. But microfluidics may be the answer to some of the, the way we culture embryos in the future. And we can picture that this future lab is actually going to be reliant on microfluidics. And, and we will be doing a lot of things with microfluidics, sperm preparation, egg retrievals, as we saw earlier in Jose's talk, embryo culture, freezing. But they'll all be driven by, uh, by input using metadata of the patient with artificial intelligence. So how do you think we will culture embryos in the future? It's interesting because we had a lot of discussion about personalised uh, patient care earlier, but I think in the future it'll be actually personalised embryo care. So you can imagine in the future, if this works, oops, can you run that video or, there you go. So imagine each embryo will be in its own little well and through AI we will actually be adjusting personally for each embryo, how it will actually be consuming certain factors within the media. So we won't have a sequential media, we'll have just a continuous media change that will cater for the embryo when it's at the one cell stage, the four cell stage, and as, that, as it's getting to the blastocyst stage. So you can see these media will be controlled, the media will be taken out and tested maybe in some way, maybe for DNA or other factors, maybe metabolic signatures. We'll take an image of the embryo and all that personalised information will control how that embryo is being fed by its culture media and how we assess it to, to know whether we're going to freeze it or not or transfer it in the future. So I believe microfluidics eventually will come into the system and how we will grow embryos. It's going to take quite a while and there's already a number of companies working on this and hopefully at some stage we'll get to that stage. So finally, I get to come to San Diego and give these talks. Um, and this comes from sharing a lot of drinks at pubs with people, so much smarter than I am. So these are the people. Marta did a lot of the work on, uh, she did her PhD on, on the FLIM. Uh, these are people we've collaborated with for many times. Jamin Shard is a fellow, an REI fellow in our department. Well, he's not with us anymore, but he did a lot of the aneuploidy, euploidy work. Uh, Tim and Dan have done a lot of work on, uh, on embryo metabolism and the FLIM system and, and some uh, long-term collaborators there that... Uh, that are also included, and of course, uh, the IVF lab, who does a lot of the hard work and lets me walk around and travel around. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me. Thank you so much for this presentation. We're gonna just wait, yeah.
All right, so as usual, this will be the, we'll have the panel and the Q&A session, if any of you have questions. Yes. Uh, my name is Cihan Holcigil. I am the lab director at Yale Fertility Center. Uh, Sangeeta, my f first question is, uh, in your presentation, I just wonder about what was the uh, time difference between the first cycle and the second cycle? You never mentioned, you know, is there a huge variation or is it, you know? Um, so the entire data set was 2014 to 2017. Yeah. So it was within the three-year period. I see, but the patients, you know, the variability between the same patients having the first cancellation and making the second. You know, we know that the stimulation, if um, after the first stimulation, in the first couple of months, the ovaries are more receptive. And then if you give a longer break, it actually takes, you know, goes back to the baseline. So did you look at the time between the cancellation and the second individual in that, the groups? Yeah, Ch Chihan, that's a good question. We did not look at that. So working with SART data, there are certain limitations. Mm -hmm. We can't even capture if a patient leaves a clinic and goes to a different clinic and tries a different cycle. Mm -hmm. Those people we couldn't capture. So, mm -hmm. you know, those are ones who've also had a second stimulation after the first cancellation. Um, and time between cycles, I mean, that's an interesting idea. Um, I don't know, though, if that wouldn't be confounded by a number of issues. It's difficult to generalize conclusions, I think, from that time okay. period. And the second question for Jurgen: um, Would you, you know, use this fast towing for completely hatched six, you know, without zona embryos? as you know, comfortable as the ones which are in the zona? It's an excellent question. Uh, yes, you know, we have, especially in the time where we started uh, biopsy, and still occasionally we have the free sonar-free embryo, so we need, based on the worksheet, this mm -hmm. embryo will be sonar-free when we're going to four of them, and we do the same thing with one minute approach. Okay, thank you. Jurgen, do you remember why it is we got, uh, it's right over here, uh, why, why did we, do the 11 minutes in the first place. I mean, the approach seems so logical with the one minute, and you showed a beautiful graph of how the embryo shrinks and then it starts to re-expand. Why on earth did we do 11 or yeah. however many minutes in the first place? It was, I think it was for, for safety reasons, you know, to make sure we sufficient dehydrate. Even for X, we do it longer. We do it 15 minutes, right? For us, at least, was a standard protocol. It's still, for most egg banks, it's 15 minutes, right? Even you can start freezing them early or moving them in VS, like, after 10 minutes. Uh, yeah, I don't know, but that's life, you know? We learn. One day, you know, thanks to Taylor, he made that approach by accident. And then, you know, people who pick it up and try it out and uh, establish it and bring it to the rest of the community. I'm sorry. Yeah, I have no, uh, you know, I think it was just so well established yeah. and for safety reasons. It's the same thing with one more loss who right? Our intention was to make sure the embryo survives because if you use not one molar, water is rushing in, you get a dead embryo. But you know, 0.25 molar is sufficient. 0.25 molar is even less sugar than in a Coca-Cola. <laughs> zero, zero question over there. <laughs> not in the diet. Yeah. Uh, thank you for an amazing presentation for everybody. I'm Mili Thakur, I'm an Arya geneticist. Question to Dr. Sakis. In the future, when we are trying to do this um, uh, personalized care of the embryo and the microfluidic system with all the technologies that we know currently, how do you see them being implemented in stages? Like what is the first thing would we see? Or a simplified question for a, from a clinician standpoint, if you had to grade the things, in my mind, euploidy right now is our cornerstone, but if we had non-invasive testing and metabolomics and epigenetics and uh, the microfluidics and other things, like how, what is, well, how would the embryo move through it on top of the euploidy, if, if at all? So, uh, I think I understood. So there, there's the concept of that we'll be able to do this all in a little box, basically. And I think we're very far, very, very far from doing that. We've already seen the sperm being prepared by microfluidics. 
Uh, we, we, see, we saw today even vitrification by microfluidics. So I think these will come stepwise. I, I would see the third one maybe being embryo culture, uh, which is sort of an, it lends itself to microfluidics. And then I think eventually those, some of those will marry between them. I think embryo culture and, and vitrification will probably be linked together. And also, I think it's very easy to, once you're starting to culture an embryo, it's very easy to, to, to shuttle that media away and start doing the analysis. So I can see these all coming in as stepwise, um, stepwise sort of uh, pieces that will allow us to actually uh, start automating um, some of these processes. So I, I, I see that's how they will come. I think we will probably go to looking at culture media. There are enough techniques now that will allow us to actually uh, analyse culture media. And I think they will actually eventually, hopefully, surpass biopsy. So we won't have to, have to uh, do that. So I can see these you know, in, in stepwise um, coming through. The proviso being that there's, you know, there are startup companies out there, companies that are supported. It takes a lot of money to do these things. It takes a lot of time to do these things, and and you know, even today we spoke about some of the things how long they take to actually come in. Uh, so it takes time. It takes money. Um, it's it's not easy to to do these. So I, I, you know, I don't see this happening within even the next five years. To be honest, some of these. Uh, quick question, Alicia, embryologist out of Denver, kind body. Um, so my question, you briefly mentioned that the metabolic uh, demands are different versus um, hatching and non-hatching embryos. Were these embryos assisted hatched or did they hatch on their own? We did it with both. We did it with uh, embryos that had not been biopsied and we did it with embryos that were actually just hatching by themselves. So we, we see consistent uh, sort of changes that, that embryos are sort of programmed to undergo as they, as they hatch, as they go from day five to day six, as the inner cell mass develops, as the trophectoderm. So it's, it's very multifactorial the way the embryo uses the, the, the media or the components in the media. And, I, and you know, again, with, with the current media we have, it's, we have them in one step. And I'm, I'm sure that, uh, I think maybe Rusty can comment on better, that, that the, the, me, the, the uterus itself is changing. We know that. The fallopian tube to the uterus is very different. And even though we tried to do that with sequential media, we sort of got taken over by the one-step media, which you know, has its benefits logistically. But I think eventually, if we, if we can cater for these changes, we, we may actually improve uh, embryo development. And, and maybe, hopefully, that would translate to live birth rates also. Awesome. Thank you. Denny, let me follow up on that. Just, just a quick question. So the, the flim analysis, I was, I was looking at your slides. Are you saying the part of the trophectoderm that has hatched has different metabolic profile than the part of the trophectoderm yeah. that's still within the zona? So yeah. it knows that it's still within the zona because it's pushing up against it, trying to expand? Yeah. And it's a chicken or the egg thing. You know, is it, has, it, has it hatched because it's expending more energy? Or does it just know it's in a different part? It's... Um, you know, we, uh, if if our time lapse was uh, pornography for um, for embryologists, then the flim is really pornographic. <laughs> so, um, but it's you know, it still. Some of us have been doing this for a long, long time, and it just amazes me the tricks the embryo has to keep going. Um, it, it's fascinating. Keeps us in business. So. Denny, uh, you made a really good point during your talk, and, and actually Rick alluded to it during his talk earlier today about the in, endometrial and uterine environment, and that is that uh, the, the big difference between the way we grow embryos in, in, in the lab and nature, one of the big differences is that we nearly grow them in, in fundamentally what's an ideal solution. It's very, the, the water-like capacity, I mean, it's not a lot different than it is right out here in the Pacific Ocean, which is absolutely nothing like the environment that they see in, in vivo. And, and I think this idea that, because, as Rick alluded to, I mean, it, it's the reproductive tract is chock full of polyhydroxylated compounds that have a profound influence on, on water and other physical phenomena. So I think it's a, a key thing that's been overlooked in embryo culture for, for too many years. But the second question, I, I had this great feeling along, well, up until now, that perhaps uh, analyzing redox potential would be a great tool for designing culture media. But now, I don't know, after your talk. What are your thoughts? Well, I, I sort of alluded to, you know, we could see all this amazing, cool stuff about a blastocyst, 
and then it doesn't translate to pregnancy as, as far as we have. Um, so uh, the conclusion, I think, is if you know anything about oocyte and embryo mitochondria, they're actually very... They're, you get what you get in the oocyte, and they're very different from your, your adult mitochondria. They're, they're, they're shaped differently, they actually work differently, and they're actually... they decline until around the blastocyst or peri-implantation phase, and then you get biosynthesis of new mitochondria. So we're, we've sort of come to the conclusion maybe to appease ourselves, you know, in, in, a, in a drunken stupor that it didn't work, that, um, that maybe the mitochondria are just different. You know, maybe what we see to get you to blastocyst is very different from the mitochondria that you need to actually continue implantation and et cetera. So, um, but maybe other met metabolic uh, factors are more important. Maybe glucose is a better way of measuring it than, than looking at mitochondrial function. Well, thank you so much. Um, I really enjoyed the presentations. Um, I have a question for you, Dr. Sakas, regarding the metabolic profiling of the embryos. So we are currently working on metabolic profiling as well but we are looking beyond just NADH and F FAD. Uh, those are obviously byproducts or cofactors in the, in the glucose cascade metabolism. So it's logical to see uh, them correlating with euploidy if glucose is an essential component of it. But, um, and and uh, the flim imaging is a, is a, a straightforward approach to look at NAD and F NADH and FAD. What's about the other metabolic, um, uh, you know, uh, components? Uh, say, um, uh, you know, you can look at, for example, amino acids, you can look at um, hormones that are maybe secreted. Have you looked at, uh, imaging is not going to solve that problem, but have you looked at other components? Yeah, I've got a few scars in my back and uh, lost quite a few dollars uh, doing that in the past <laughs> <laughs> with other startup companies. That Some of you may have been affected, I apologise. <laughs> um, so, you know, we, we're we trying and there, there are factors in there. Uh, there are technologies, you know, as we get better at measuring these things, that, that there, there are technologies out there will do it. Uh, some of the slides I skipped over were a, 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 another technology that looks at autofluorescence called hyperspectral microscopy, which looks at many more factors, and, and there's some really amazing data from Kylie Dunning in Australia and Jeremy Thompson showing, again, differences between euploidy and aneuploidy, and also even oxygen tension changing the profile in bovine embryos. So there, there are a lot of promising technologies out there, and I, I think, it, you know, hopefully... Uh, at some stage, we'll hit the we'll hit the jackpot and understand which one sort of is is the best one. And, and the metabolic profiling of the trophectodem, trophectodem and ICM are different. Obviously, you showed that in, on on the slide. Which one correlates better? Are, are you looking at both profiles to correlate? We've looked at euploidy? we looked at everything under the sun to try to get to predict pregnancy. No, no the euploidy. Would euploidy? Oh, with euploidy. Yeah. What profile correlate better, trophectodem or ICM, um, metabolic profile? I'd have to go back and look at our data. I don't think we saw differences when we segmented each one out. No other questions? I, I actually, I, I was thinking of something when Jürgen was showing his, his slides, that a lot of people are scared of automation, um, but I, it sort of nightmares came back to me when you showed the planos, and I'm sure. <laughs> and I think you should sh you should show you should play the sound of the because a lot of us I think would start shaking if we heard it. <laughs> but but you know people fear automation, but you know two and a half hours versus what you got you've got down to six minutes or something for a freeze and a warming and a, a thaw. So the you know these are examples of automation that. Many, many of us remember waiting two and a half hours and sort of hanging around, going home, and then coming back to take embryos off the planer. You know, so we've seen automation for many, many years, but, you know, it hasn't... We're still holding these conferences. There's still 12,000 people to go to Escher and ASRM. Um, I would not fear the automation. I think it's going to make your lives much better than, you know, what Jürgen showed about... Uh, you know, a, a planar versus vitrification. And, and obviously it improves things too. Um, you know, we, it was by chance, I think we used to expect probably 60% of embryos to survive with slow freezing. 
and now you start crying if you're under 90 percent so that's just you know it reminded me of a lot of things <laughs> i'm gonna have nightmares tonight about <laughs> planers i think danny's got ptsd from the planer <laughs> used to have used to have hair before you use a planer <laughs> that's true yes no he's right and i think you're right that's a good point. Your talks were amazing. And so, yeah, I think the automation, semi-automation is, um, I don't know, the chip, lab on a chip sounds great, but I think it's a time away. Still a ways. Actually, I had a, uh, I, I love talks where it's such a simple question. You think, why didn't I think of that? And I think Sangeeta's was like that. But what's really interesting is you see all these papers that come out, you know, saying, oh, we treated, you know, failed patients with such and such technique and we got pregnancies and then you see something just as simple as you know I've just changed I've tweaked my protocol a bit and I'm and you, you had really good low birth rates in those second cycles it just shows how fluid the system is and someone that you know fails three cycles it just may not have been their time it's you know the egg is there on, on the fourth chance so I, I was really fascinated by such it, it, it was a very simple question but it, like it's very uh um, it was shocking to see how successful it was just doing a second cycle. Yeah, I think that's 70 amazing. plus percent yeah. make it to retrieval. I'm not saying they get a baby, but they make it to retrieval. Yeah. On, on that, did the cancellation criteria change at all? I mean, are you less likely to cancel a, a suboptimal stem because they've already failed? Do you, was that accounted for anyway? Well, this was SART data, so I. I'm not sure I can answer that. I can tell you in our hands, we will take patients to retrieval the second time, even if they don't really strictly meet criteria, we'll stretch the follicle diameter and, oh, look, there's maybe three, we really need three, but it's two plus, yeah. So I, I suspect that did go on. Because you, you know, these patients, I don't have to tell everybody here, it's terrible to cancel them and they have no recourse. So you really want to give them that chance. Yeah. Especially if you've upped their dose of gonadotropin. Yes, it went up 400. Yeah. Yeah, I use, and so of course you, you know, they paid all this money, exactly. Did you see any difference between IVF and ICSI fertilized embryos in terms of embryo metabolism? No, no, we didn't. We, we, I tell you, we looked at everything we could to, to see if we could find difference. This, this was with the startup company, so basically they were. Um, it was die or survive, basically, for them. So they, they looked at everything. Uh, and, you know, very clever people uh, ran multiple formats of artificial intelligence and, net, you know, uh, neural networking on the data. We couldn't see... Uh, and we, we, we did up about 120 transfers and had the metabolic signature of the blastocyst we transferred. And we couldn't discern a difference between those that gave, gave a pregnancy and didn't give a pregnancy. Although we saw all those parameters I showed in, in the blastocyst, we could, I could tell you the inner cell mass and trophectoderm, you could see euploidy and aneuploidy, we could see to 80% confidence, but it didn't translate to pregnancy, which like shocked us, especially that one. Although maybe Rick with his soccer ball would not be shocked at that. And <laughs> <laughs> so. All right. Well, thank you all very much. What, how, what time should we be back? Is there a break? So we have a 10 minute break. And then after that, we're going to do, uh, well, for those who are interested in the uh, embryology workshop, it's going to start after that, after 10 minutes. And then we have, uh, uh, we're going to be meeting uh, at the uh, reception at 6.30 or 6.20.25 so that we can, uh, the buses will be coming and then we can head to, to, the, uh, to the cruise. So you have about two hours, about two hours. Um, but if you are attending the workshop, you can go about 15 minutes. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Let me just quickly, oh. thank you. Yeah. 
I'm going to quickly just explain the workshops. So workshops, if you are interested in CEUs, are required. They will earn you CEUs. And if you look on your badges that you've received, there should be a color-coded sticker on your badge. So we are going to divide you up by your color code. And we have four workshops today. One of them is by Embryo Director. The next one is RI Witnessing. And then followed by Biopsy Rinsing and Loading Techniques by Progenesis. And then the last one is RS. RSI, they're um, showing how to efficiently use their brand new um, uh, sperm separating device. So we really encourage rotating through this because the, the goal of this entire uh, conference today is to show you the newest technologies, to show you technologies you otherwise wouldn't use in your clinics and your laboratories. So even if you're not wanting to do this for CEUs, we really encourage you go into that room and at least rotate through. So it's 20 minute rotations. You'll divide it by your color code and then we'll, we'll sound a bell. You'll know to rotate um, and it'll be a very useful and a very efficient um, manner of learning new techniques quickly. So I encourage that. But thank you very much for our speakers. We really enjoyed the day today. Yes, and our, we're looking forward to tonight. So we'll see you downstairs at 6 after that. Thank you. Testing, testing. Hi, everyone. Just wanted to say thank you once again. If we could have all of our speakers from today join us back up on the stage once more so we can take a group photo, uh, we would greatly appreciate it. So again, if all speakers from today could join us back on the stage. Thank you so much.